and welcome to the Video Psychosis Podcast. This is episode 15. I'm your host, Strong Knots. Uh, we haven't done too many shows this year, slowed down a little bit, but as per usual, every October, by the time November hits, we will be posting our annual Halloween viewing episode, and that's what we're doing again this year. It's going to be a little bit different for this episode because we're going to have several guest spots sprinkled throughout the show but for the most part it is going to be yours truly flying solo telling you about the many many movies i watched and we're just going to go ahead and get started kick right into it since there's a lot to discuss the music that you're hearing behind me is the song haunted by Harold by painted faces from their new album american basement and that was just released on bandcamp so give that a listen solid stuff we're going to have another one of their songs for the outro later on So first up on the show, we're going to talk about 1927, The Unknown, by Todd Browning, starring Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces. Now, Lon Chaney had actually made ten films between 1919 and 1929 with Todd Browning, including uh, The Lost Movie, London After Midnight, The Unholy Three, The Blackbird, Where East is East, worked with him several times. This movie is really great, really interesting. It was an early role for actress Joan Crawford, who had actually been acting for four years before this film. She'd appeared in the Frank Borzegi movie The Circle in 1925, and she claimed that working with Lon Chaney actually inspired her to give acting her all. She was uh, really influenced by performing with him. Uh, All available surviving prints of the film are 49 minutes long, but they're constantly listed as 63 minutes for some reason. This is a great one. It's basically about this guy who works in a carnival. He plays an armless dude who's able to throw knives and smoke cigarettes with his feet but it turns out he actually does have arms and he's hiding them because he's on the run from the cops and i really really recommend checking out this movie it's terrific it's one of those cruel twist of fate movies personally my favorite todd browning film of the four that i've seen so far a lot more of his stuff i want to check out like the show the mystic lots of others we're going to move from 1927 into the 1930s here start off with 1932's the Most Dangerous Game, directed by Irving Pichel and Ernest B. Shodzak. Now, Irving Pichel, that was an interesting guy. He had acted in several films like Dracula's Daughter from 1936. He also directed films like Quicksand with Mickey Rooney and Peter Lorre, They Won't Believe Me with Susan Hayward and Jane Greer. And uh, Shodzak, obviously, was most famous for directing King Kong, which has a lot in common with this movie. They were filmed at the same time. They have a few of the same actors, like uh, Fay Ray, Robert Armstrong, and, uh, you know... Ernest had directed other films like Son of Kong, the sequel, Dr. Cyclops, Mighty Joe Young. This was a pretty controversial movie when it originally came out. It's basically about this hunter who gets tired of hunting animals, so he starts hunting humans on his secluded island, you know, causing shipwrecks and stuff. And there's a trophy room scene where he's got all these, like, severed heads and jars and, you know, stuffed dead bodies down there and stuff. Apparently it was much longer in the original version, but it freaked audiences out, so they cut it down. And, you know, this movie, obviously, it's been remade many, many times. And obviously it inspired countless other films like Hard Target, Surviving the Game, Turkey Shoot, Deadly Prey. Watch this movie, it's terrific. Next up, same year, 1932, we got Carl Theodore Dreyer's Vampire. Dreyer's first talkie picture, he was kind of reluctant to using dialogue, but he had, you know, he went head on in tackling it. He had the actors speaking in three different languages while they were filming. Fun fact about this movie, the, the main actor, Nicholas de Goonsberg, he also produced the film, and uh, he helped pretty much get the movie made, but he used the alias Julian West because of his family's disapproval about uh, his you know, the profession he wanted as an actor. They didn't, they kind of looked down on that. And this movie, when it originally came out, it was booed when it premiered in Berlin and actually received negative reviews, but now it's considered a classic, which is pretty interesting. Things didn't work out too hot for uh, Carl Theodore Dreyer. He had a nervous breakdown not long after he made this movie, and he was admitted into a mental hospital in France. I think one of my favorite sequences in this movie is uh, the guy's, the main character's nightmare of being buried alive. There's also this really striking shot where you see a guy digging up the earth, but when he's throwing the dirt from the ground, you know, with his shovel. It sort of looks like it's shot backwards or something, like the dirt flies up from the ground to the shovel when he's digging it out. Pretty surreal. But, uh, you know, this is an interesting movie. Check it out if you like classic horror. It's currently also streaming on the Criterion site, along with Todd Browning's The Unknown. Last movie of the 1930s here we're going to talk about is Dwayne Esper's Maniac from 1934. Oh boy. 
Now, Dwayne Esper, for those of you who don't know, he was a key figure of the early roadshow exploitation films. You know, he produced and directed The Truth About Sex, this opium film, Sinister Harvest, uh, a movie called Narcotic. I'm sure you can guess what that's about. Modern Motherhood. And of course, two years after this movie, he made Marijuana, The Weed with Roots in Hell. And it came out the same year as Reefer Madness, actually. Uh, the making of this movie... Pretty bizarre. There's a lot of unknown, uncredited people in the cast, uh, just sort of faces that have disappeared into the ether over the years. And there's references to a couple of Edgar Allan Poe stories here, uh, both The Black Cat and The Murders in the Rue Morgue. There's going to be a lot of Edgar Allan Poe on the show this year. When this movie came out, it was kind of uh, a disappointment, so they retitled it Sex Maniac after the disappointing first exhibition, and then immediately it became a success, you know. Because sex sells. There's footage in this movie that's lifted from uh, Benjamin Christensen's Haxen, as well as, well as other films like Fritz Lang's De Nibelungen Siegfried, and uh, some hell scenes from the Italian film Machiste in Hell. And part of the reason they get away with showing all this graphic stuff in the movie, in the classic tradition of roadshow uh, exploitation films, they try to claim that it's an educational movie, that it has educational value. And so you see the definition of medical terms like paresis. But this is a pretty shocking movie for the 30s, commonly called one of the worst of all time. You've got a guy who thinks he's an orangutan who steals this woman. You see her bare breasts for a couple of seconds. Uh, probably the most notorious scene in the movie, there's this cat that gets its eye gouged out, and the guy eats the, the gouged out eye. Cult movies author Danny Perry said that this is probably the worst film he's ever seen, which is really saying something if you look through some of the movies he's got in those books. But I enjoyed this. I thought it was a lot of fun. Pretty shocking for the time, too. So check that one out. It's available on YouTube. We're going to jump now into the 1940s, and we've got director Maurice Turner's Carnival of Sinners from 1943. This is based on an 1832 novel called The Enchanted Hand, and it was adapted a couple more times between the 60s and the 80s. Now, the director, Maurice Turner, he's the father of director Jacques Turner. And this guy had also made other films like The Blue Bird and Prunella, sort of precursors to German expressionist cinema. You know, really odd stylized costumes and set designs. And uh, you can actually see an interesting bit about the making of this movie in this Bertrand Tavernier film called Safe Conduct from 2002. And this is your basic story about a um, guy checks into a hotel where there's a power outage and he's been holding on to this chest. It goes missing. Everybody wants to know, what's up with this missing chest? Who are you? Why are the cops looking for you? And he tells him a story about how he got this talisman from a chef uh, that's supposed to give him these powers. You know, basically, the longer he holds on to this talisman that he got from the devil, basically, the more he owes the devil to give it back to him. And uh, there's a great sequence toward the climax of this movie where he returns to his hotel in Nice and he meets all the previous owners of the talisman. And they tell him about how they, achieve, how they got the talisman and what happened to them after getting it. Really interesting little film. We're going to go into 1944 now here. And I've got my first special guest speaker of the show talking about Lewis Allen's The Uninvited from 1944. Take it away. Hey, my name is Max K. Meehan. And I'm very pleased to be here on Video Psychosis. Massive waves of gratitude for having me. Today I'm going to be talking about 1944's the Uninvited, just one film on an extremely short list, in my opinion, of truly great supernatural thrillers. Back when I was working at the movie place in New York City, which was a shop that had the distinction of servicing Columbia's film department, this was on my guarded employee picks shelf. This is richly stocked with textured backgrounds and makes wonderful use of lighting and shadow, and it's just one of those films that I really don't think would have worked had it been made in color. And it's also unique because at the time, 1944, we were in the shank of creature feature mania. And this was a shift toward creating something that was a little more sophisticated, spiritual in nature, of course. It sought to actually utilize A-listers at the time. The genre was particularly notable prior to this because it had evolved its own stars, such as Karloff and Lugosi. But here we have folks like Ray Milland participating, as well as Donald Crisp, who had garnered an Oscar for his performance in How Green Was My Valley in 1944, I believe. You have Ruth Hussey, who was a well-regarded actress herself and had previous Oscar nominations. The story follows a composer and his sister who stumble across a palatial house on a seaside cliff, and they wind up buying it on a whim, which is kind of weird. Uh, but they buy it and they relocate from their dreary, dusty city lives to a seaside town. And one of the weird asides to this 
movie is that it really features a clash of different society types. It's really about rich people at odds at points, which is not really relatable now, or maybe not even then, but damned if it's not interesting. With the haunting in the story, it really spurs people who are involved to unravel the causation of the ghostly activity which threatens to possess the living and repeat the tragedies which have cast this black cloud over the over the house the protagonists really have to be proactive in figuring out what's going on before it claims any more lives and this is a very rare instance where you have characters in a very stationary subject having to go out and figure shit out. Uh, another film that does this very effectively is The Omen. Another film that does that really well, in my opinion, Witchboard. And this film was fraught with some problems behind the scenes. It is, a, it is a warm blanket, as I said. Rare is a modern genre film anymore that really has this sort of feel to it. And the, uh, Lewis Allen was the director here, and he had a, a a Broadway background. He was also British. I think these are two elements that really service the film. Of course, it has a very uh, deep British sensibility to it, and of course, it feels also very stagey. Alan was really against showing any sort of apparition in this story, and this is one of those films that is in the pantheon of studio versus visionary. Uh, you could throw this in the pile of films such as Curse of the Demon, the director found uh, themselves at odds with the studio who wanted to deliver something else to the audience than the director did. I think this is a film that really did need to produce a moment where we saw a ghost or a shape or something, as there is really no question that there is something going on in this house. The optical effects employed here still stand to this day, in my opinion, as some of the best in terms of depicting an actual spirit. So many modern paranormal thrillers tend to show it all off, but the opticals used here really feel like they're in the film. They feel, they, feel, they feel like they're just ingrained in that moment that you're watching. Anyway, this is certainly a film that I think ranks highly in terms of delivering mood, atmosphere, and even a little bit of dread. Thanks for having me. So that was Max Meehan talking about The Uninvited from 1944. Now from 1945, we're going to talk about Robert Wise's The Body Snatcher. Now Robert Wise, pretty famous director. He obviously made the horror classic The Haunting, uh, as well as other interesting films like The Day the Earth Stood Still, the Robert Mitchum Western Blood on the Moon, West Side Story, The Sound of Music. He had a pretty diverse career. This film was based on a short story by Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island and The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's pretty much based on the Birkin hair murders. The photographer Robert DeGrasse also shot Jacques Tourneur's The Leopard Man, and Roy Webb, who composed the score, he'd also worked on some other great films like Fixed Bayonets by Sam Fuller, Out of the Past, They Won't Believe Me, Hitchcock's Notorious. Some interesting actors in here, of course, you got Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, but you've also got Henry Daniel, who plays Dr. McFarlane, who was in The Great Dictator, The Philadelphia Story, Witness for the Prosecution. This movie marked the eighth and final time that Lugosi and Karloff would appear on screen together, and right at the beginning of the film, there's actually a little bit about the this dog who won't leave behind this boy's grave. And this was based on a real dog uh, called Greyfriars Bobby, a Sky Terrier who stayed on his master John Gray's grave for 14 years in Edinburgh. But I thought this was a really good atmospheric movie, and obviously Karloff is great and sinister. He's always fun to watch, so definitely check this one out. Next up, we're going to end the 1940s with Robert Siodmak's The Spiral Staircase from 1946. Now, Siodmak, very versatile, undervalued director. Really famous for his film noir, you know, like stuff like The Killers with Burt Lancaster, Criss Cross, made a lot of films. And this one, The Spiral Staircase, has actually been remade three times, but it was a pretty clear influence on other stuff like Wait Until Dark with Audrey Hepburn, See No Evil with Mia Farrow, uh, Argento's The Cat of Nine Tales, Mute Witness, uh, most recently Hush. There's some great atmosphere in this movie. Uh, there's a rainstorm outside the whole time. It's a little bit predictable who the killer is in this movie. Uh, basically about this guy who's picking off disabled girls at this boarding house. Knowing who the... Predicting who the killer is doesn't really tamper the effect. There's a really clever use of foreshadowing in this movie. Some pretty interesting psychological reasons for why the killer is who he is. And the ending is a little bit <laughs> implausible, but still hopeful and pretty nice. It's kind of interesting how trauma both causes the character's muteness and then heals it. 
at the end, so I thought that was neat. Really great death scene where the killer knocks over some candles and you can only see the victim's hands as the murder happens. Check this one out. Kino Lorber just put out a Blu-ray not long ago. Excellent film. We're going to jump into the 1950s now here with Cult of the Cobra from 1955, directed by Francis D. Lyon. He had made some other films like Destination, Inner Space, Castle of Evil from 1966. There's an actress in this film, Faith Domergue, and she was a replacement for Mary Blanchard, the original actress in the film, who was in Abbott and Costello go to Mars. She was originally cast but fired after a few days and so Faith Domergue replaced her. And Faith Domergue was in This Island Earth, uh, Fulci's perversion story, The House of Seven Corpses. She had a horrible time on the set because her husband divorced her uh, after returning from Europe and she was crying her eyes out, which is part of the reason they couldn't do many close-ups for her. But I think you kind of feel a lot of that sadness and despair in her performance. She's really great as this cobra woman that comes back to get some soldiers who try to take pictures of these snake worshippers called the Lamians. And uh, they're a similar kind of plot to Cat People here, but a really interesting film. This is a pretty fun little monster movie. Not as good as Cat People, but worth checking out if you enjoy this kind of stuff. Next up, we're going to have a Jack Arnold double feature starting with 1955's Tarantula. Now, Jack Arnold, obviously, one of the best of the uh, 50s creature feature directors. He made both of the Black Lagoon films, as well as other stuff like The Space Children, Monster on the Campus. But he also made a lot of other kinds of films, like lots of film noir and westerns. He made High School Confidential with Russ Tamblin. Jack Arnold had directed four episodes of this TV show called Science Fiction Theater, and he did an episode called No Food for Thought, which ended up being the basis for this movie. Now, you've got the lead actor, John Agar. He was in other films like She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, did several films with John Wayne, also in The Mole People, The St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Mr. No Legs, Miracle Mile, Nightbreed, Body Bags. You've also got Mara Corday, who was in The Giant Claw and The Black Scorpion. The last four films of her career would be bit parts in Clint Eastwood movies, The Gauntlet, Sudden Impact, Pink Cadillac, The Rookie. And speaking of the Clint Eastwood connection here, his first film role was actually a small part in Jack Arnold's Revenge of the Creature as a scientist, and here he also plays an uncredited role as a jet pilot toward the end of the film dropping the napalm on the giant tarantula. Because it is from 1955, there's some hilariously dated, <laughs> you know, dialogue, like when the sheriff sees the giant tarantula, he says, jump in Jupiter, you know. But this is a pretty fun film. So that moves us into Jack Arnold's second film here that we're going to talk about, 1957, The Incredible Shrinking Man. And I liked this movie a lot more than Tarantula. It, it actually has the same spider from Tarantula in it. This is one that Richard Matheson wrote the screenplay for. He had uh, actually written a novel that he finished during the production of the film, and it was inspired by a scene from this Ray Milland movie called Let's Do It Again. When they finished this movie and played it for the test audiences, they wanted a different ending, but the director's original ending stayed intact because of the success of his creature from the Black Lagoon films. Hilariously enough, one of the test cards from that audience screening said, this is an insult to the brain power of my two-year-old son. <laughs> Clearly, her two-year-old son was not ready for this philosophical ending to a movie about a shrinking man. Uh, this is just a great movie. And luckily, thank God for all of us, they tried. To, they were thinking about making a comedic version with Eddie Murphy in the early 2000s, but that was thankfully scrapped. The special effects in this movie are fantastic. Lots of gigantic props made to create the illusion of the protagonist's diminutiveness. Richard Matheson had written a sequel to this, but it never came to fruition, sadly. I would like to see where they would have taken this film. Uh, at its next turn. And if you watch the original trailer for it, that's Orson Welles narrating. So, excellent movie. Check this out. It's currently streaming on a couple of websites, so I highly recommend checking this one out. Keep it rolling through the 50s here. 1958, it's Herbert L. Strzok's How to Make a Monster. This is a really good movie. Originally released on a double bill with Teenage Caveman by American International Pictures. And this movie is like a high-concept meta-American International movies, you know, where characters are working for that film studio on a film that was actually made called Frank Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. They also reference uh, Horrors of the Black Museum, which would come out later. And at the climax of the film, you see the monsters from other AIP movies like Invasion of the Saucermen, The She-Creature, It Conquered the World, Attack of the Puppet People. You see the masks for the monsters on the wall of the main character Pete's house. And uh, Pete, the main character, he's a makeup artist who tries to get revenge for being fired after working for this studio for several years. Uh, he was in a lot of stuff like Robert Altman's TV movie, Nightmare in Chicago, uh, Valley of the Dolls, The Great Northfield Minnesota Raid. And the director had worked in other horror movies. He also made Gog, I Was a Teenage Frankenstein, which is heavily referenced here, uh, with Gary Conway reprising his role as 
the Teenage Frankenstein. Also, like Teenage Frankenstein, most of the movie's in black and white until the final scenes, like the last two reels are suddenly in color, in flaming color, as the poster promises. And humorously enough, Sam Arkoff actually wanted Bela Lugosi to play the role in this movie, but he had no idea he had actually died two years before it was made, in 1956. There's a really uh, ridiculous music number in the movie called You Gotta Have EU by a dude named John Ashley. And that was in there to, you know, try and scrape a couple bucks out of a marginally successful singer at the time. And, uh, yeah, check this movie out. It's really cool. Two more films from the 50s here. First up, it's Beast from Haunted Cave, directed by Monty Hellman. This was Monty Hellman's uh, first film. He would go on to make, you know, classic movies like The Shooting, Ride in the Whirlwind, Tulane Blacktop, uh, my personal favorite, Cockfighter. And humorously enough, also Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. The movie was produced by Roger Corman's brother Gene Corman, who actually just passed away a couple months ago. The script was written by Charles B. Griffith, who wrote several Corman films like A Bucket of Blood, The Little Shop of Horrors, Death Race 2000. And this is one of those movies that starts off as a crime story, turns into a horror film, you know. Uh, some people rob a ski lift or a ski lodge or something, and then they have to hide away and walk through the snow. And the script was actually kind of a variation on a script Griffith had written earlier called Naked Paradise. And later on, it got rewritten yet again for a creature from the haunted sea. The main mastermind behind the heist uh, is played by Frank Wolf, who was in a lot of Italian films like uh, Francesca Rossi's Salvatore Giuliano. Uh, he was in the Great Silence, Once Upon a Time in the West. He worked with Enzo Castellari on Cold Eyes of Fear, Fernando de Leo on Caliber 9. He's in Radley Metzger's The Licorice Quartet. Definitely a recognizable face. And in classic Roger Corman tradition, uh, they filmed this movie back-to-back, -back, same location in the South Dakota Black Hills. Right after production on this was finished, they made Ski Troop Attack in the same place. There you go. Not a great movie, obviously, but a pretty fun little monster movie worth checking out just for the cast alone. Last movie of the 1950s we're going to talk about here is Edward L. Kahn's The Four Skulls of Jonathan Drake from 1959. Now, Ed Kahn, he directed other films like Creature with the Atom Brain, The Zombies of Moritau, Lots of lots of horror films. Also, lots of films that aren't horror or sci-fi themed. I mean, the guy directed over 100 movies. And this film, Four Skulls, was actually made as part of a package deal with another film he was doing called Invisible Invaders, both of which were released in 1959 on a double bill together. And that same year, in 1959, the director made fucking seven movies, which is crazy. Uh, you know, titles like Vice Raid, Inside the Mafia. So, a busy guy, for sure. This is a movie <laughs> that's... Not really anything particularly fancy, despite the fact that they reference Julius Caesar several times. But it does have some interesting mythology about it, like the Sansa's shrunken heads. Uh, it's pretty gruesome for a 50s movie. Lots of beheadings. And you got a 200-year-old evil doctor uh, hanging around with this assistant going around decapitating people with a bamboo blade. Really interesting movie. Doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's solid. So we brought up Roger Corman talking about Beast from Haunted Cave, and we're going to slide into the 1960s here now with a little film from 1962 directed by Roger Corman called Tales of Terror. Tales of Terror, this is a horror anthology. All three of the stories are based on Edgar Allan Poe short stories. Edgar Allan Poe once again on the show. We'll talk about him some more later. This is yet another film written by Richard Matheson, just like The Incredible Shrinking Man. The first story, for my opinion, is the weakest of the three, but interestingly enough, they reused sets and footage from House of Usher in it. Now, The Black Cat, my favorite story in the movie. This is actually kind of heavily referenced in The Comedy of Terrors, a film released the next year with three of the same actors here. And it's great, man. I mean, probably the only one of the three that's played for comedy instead of taken seriously. There's a great wine taste test competition between Fortunato, uh, Vincent Price's character, who's based on Ernie Kovacs, a character he played, and Montresor, Peter Lorre's character. There's a really nice use of squeezed anamorphic for a hallucination sequence here. In the final story, the facts in the case of Monsieur Valdemar, it's basically about a crooked hypnotist played by Basil Rathbone who wants this guy's wife, so he uses a color wheel to hypnotize him while he's sick, and soon he dies, and, you know, Vincent Price passes on, and he's got this eerie death rattle, and he's, you hear his voice talking from beyond the grave. Sort of sounds like when you talk in front of a fan, it's got that kind of thing going on. I enjoyed Tales of Terror. Not one of my favorite Corman films, not one of my favorite Edgar Allan Poe films, but worth checking out. If you enjoy horror anthologies, it's a classic. Next up from 1964, we've got William Castle's Straight Jacket. Pretty fun little movie. 
Actor Lee Major's first big film role, he would become famous as the Six Million Dollar Man not long after this movie. And of course, because they got Joan Crawford in this movie, there's a lot of prominent Pepsi product placement, you know, because her husband was the CEO before he died. And speaking of Pepsi, uh, Dr. Anderson, a character in the movie, is played by Mitchell Cox, who was the vice president of the Pepsi-Cola Corporation, so... (laughs) Joan Crawford obviously was extending her hand to look out for her Pepsi people. And of course, because it's a William Castle movie, there was a gimmick when it was released where they would give the audience cardboard axes with fake blood on them. And just like Psycho, another film written by Robert Block, uh, there's an expository epilogue added on to the film that was, you know, made to please Joan Crawford and make her feel like the focal point of the film kind of explains the psychology of the killer, just like the ending of Psycho. George Kennedy's in this movie, and he's he's a B-movie icon. You know, this was his fifth film. He would go on to do, you know, serious films like The Dirty Dozen and Cool Hand Luke, but probably mostly known to B-movie aficionados from stuff like Demon Warp and Wacko, Just Before Dawn, films like that. While we're in the year 1964, I said we'd talk about some more Roger Corman, so now it's time for The Mask of the Red Death. This is currently on Shudder, streaming on a lot of sites, Amazon Prime, Vudu. Check it out. Shot by Nicholas Rogue, uh, who would go on to become an impressive director in his own right. This is one of eight films that Roger Corman made that were based on Edgar Allan Poe stories. And uh, this one also incorporates elements of Hop Frog into it. Funny story about when they were making this movie, the actress in it, Jane Asher, she asked Roger Corman if she could invite her friend on the set for lunch, and he said sure, and her friend was Paul McCartney. She brought him on the set, and Roger Corman had no idea who the hell he was. He was just like, oh yeah, sure, nice to meet you. <laughs> so that's interesting. And uh, you've got some recognizable faces. Cases here like Hazel Court, who was in The Curse of Frankenstein and The Raven, Nigel Green, who was in Corridors of Blood, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, Patrick McGee, of course, big fan of him, Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, uh, The Birthday Party, The Servant, Seance on a Wet Afternoon, Asylum, Tales from the Crypt, Patrick McGee is a legend, you know, big fan of that guy. And this is streaming on several, several places, so definitely give that one a look. One of Corman's best films. And of course, it wouldn't be a Halloween podcast without getting Freddie Francis involved. So next up, it's 1965's Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. This was the very first Amicus Anthology horror film. I've talked about Torture Garden, Asylum, and From Beyond the Grave on the show before, but they also made The House of the Drip Blood, uh, The Vault of Horror, which is the worst of the bunch. But this was Freddie Francis's seventh film. He'd already kind of established his name in horror films with stuff like The Brain, Uh, Nightmare from 1964, The Evil of Frankenstein, and he would go on to make more horror films and become an even bigger icon of the genre with stuff like The Skull, The Psychopath, The Deadly Bees, Girly, The Creeping Flesh, Craze, lots of others. And yet again, here's another Paul McCartney connection. Actors Christopher Lee and Kenny Lynch, who plays Sammy Coyne in the voodoo story, they would both appear on the cover of the Wings album Band on the Run. Donald Sutherland is in one of the stories in this movie, and he was not a fan of this film. (laughs) <laughs> which is hilarious because he's made far worse movies i really enjoyed this one you got peter cushing in here neil mccallum uh, who's like this british william shatner lookalike alan freeman who uh, would play god in a couple episodes of the young ones several years later uh, roy castle really enjoyed this movie i think the voodoo story is definitely my favorite next up 1966, Mario Bava's Kill Baby Kill. And this is an interesting movie. Not one of my favorite Bava films, but the making of it was insane. You know, they ran out of money two weeks into filming this movie, and most of the cast and crew decided to finish it without pay. And there's a lot of stock library music. There's some music from Blood and Black Lace in here, but there's also, you know, music from The Murder Clinic from 1966, The Long Hair of Death, The Whip and the Body. I mean, there's several other films that they stole music from. Now here's something kind of interesting. There's the, there's the ghost of a little girl in this movie. Bava auditioned tons of girls to play the ghost. Uh, the character's name is Melissa Graps, but he couldn't find the right one, so he ended up using a boy for the role, who was the son of his concierge. There was a lot of inspiration that came out of this movie for other directors like the the little girl's ghost kind of has this bouncing ball that's always floating around and the ball's bouncing around with nobody inside on its own and Federico Fellini was inspired by that he referenced it in his Toby Dammit segment from Spirits of the Dead Uh, they also kind of used that idea or the image of the floating ball in fear.com which you know you don't need to see but Bava's own son Lamberto who actually was an assistant director on this film He would reference it himself years later in the film within a film from his 80s movie, A Blade in the Dark. Like I said, not one of my favorite Bava movies, but it is pretty cool, atmospheric. And here's another ghost movie from 1966, although a less serious one. Alan Rafkin's The Ghost and Mr. Chicken with Don Knotts. 
Does that name sound familiar to anybody? Several actors from the Andy Griffith Show actually appear in this movie. You got Charles Lane, Hal Smith, Dorothy Newman, Burt Mustin, Hope Summers, Rita Shaw. And the story of this movie is pretty similar to actually an episode of the Andy Griffith Show from the fourth season called The Haunted House. But uh, this is a fun little movie. This is like something you could show your kids if they're not ready for a real horror movie, you know, but they want to see something kind of funny and just slightly spooky enough to not actually scare anybody, you know. It's, it's pretty goofy, almost like a kind of caper movie. I love the score for this movie. Uh, it was done by Vic Muzzy. He would also do the score for four other Don Knotts movies, like The Reluctant Astronaut, Shake His Gun in the West, The Love God, How to Frame a Fig. And yeah, like I said, it's a fun little film. Not great, but it's a good one. You can, you know, watch it with the whole family. Next up, we've got Curtis Harrington's Games from 1967. Now, I just watched Night Tide not too long ago and talked about it on the last episode of my show, uh, episode 14. And Curtis Harrington also made Queen of Blood, What's the Matter with Helen, Whoever Slew Auntie Rue, The Killing Kind, Ruby. So he worked a lot in the horror genre. And, you know, the stars of this movie, Catherine Ross and James Caan, humorously enough, this was both of their, you know, fifth feature film appearances. You've got other recognizable character actors like Simone Signorette, of Diabolique and the Sleeping Car Murder. Uh, You got Kent Smith from both of the Cat People films, as well as Sean Max, The Spiral Staircase. You got Don Stroud, who's like a B-movie icon. He was in Tick, Tick, Tick. The Amityville Horror, Sweet 16, Django Unchained. And you've also got Estelle Winwood from The Producers and Murder by Death. So, some pretty recognizable faces here. That's pretty cool. And I just talked about Ghost and Mr. Chicken, and guess what? The spooky organ music that you hear in the Ghost and Mr. Chicken also makes an appearance in this movie. It's an interesting movie, takes a while to get going, kind of more of a thriller than a horror movie, but it does have occasional supernatural elements. The ending is a little bit predictable, but there's some really fun, goofy 60s counterculture set design. I don't know, I enjoyed it. Not amazing, but worth seeing. Next movie I'm going to talk about, from 1968, actually made for TV, it's Jonathan Miller's Whistle and I'll Come to You. And this is one of my favorite films that I saw in October for my Halloween viewing. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. It's not even an hour long. Like I said, it was made for TV for a British TV program called Omnibus, which was mostly a documentary series, but it was so popular when it came out that it inspired a yearly series called A Ghost Story for Christmas on the BBC. And between 1971 and 1978, each year around Christmas, they would put out a different M.R. James adaptation. And uh, they even did a reboot in 2005. And this one, of course, like I said, really popular. It was remade in 2010 with John Hurt as the main character. This one stars Michael Hordern. And if that name's not immediately familiar, he was the narrator in Barry Lyndon, but he also did voiceover work for Labyrinth, Watership Down, he appeared in several of Richard Lester's films, he was in Anthony Mann's El Cid, uh, Theater of Blood, Gandhi, I mean the guy had been acting since 1939, he's like a British film legend. Probably one of my favorite ghost stories I've ever seen. Genuinely creepy. Really well made, great photography, terrific, terrific, terrific. Loved it. One of the best things I've seen all year. Not just Halloween, all year. Check it out. We're going to finish off the 1960s here with Michael Reeves' Witchfinder General from 1968. One of Vincent Price's best movies. He actually thought that his role here was uh, the best performance he gave in a horror film. The director actually wanted Donald Pleasance for the role that Vincent Price plays, uh, Matthew Hopkins, but that didn't work out, and there was a lot of tension between the two of them. They clashed on the set a lot, and American International, when they released the film in the U.S., they changed the title, changed the score, and put some voiceover from an Edgar Allan Poe poem to make the new title work, The Conqueror Worm. So, (laughs) apparently some British sailors saw the film in Hong Kong, And then when they came to America, saw it under the different title of Conqueror Worm, and they got pissed and demanded a refund. They were, like, knocking over trash cans and stuff. And the theater theater manager refunded them and then sent the bill to AIP so that they would pay for the damages. (laughs) So that's pretty funny. Now, Michael Reeves is one of those classic, tragic Hollywood stories. He died six months after the film's New York premiere. Uh, He overdosed from a combination of barbiturates and alcohol. This movie, of course... Really violent. Uh, The opening scene sets the tone with this screaming woman dragged to the gallows, and she passes out from shock and gets splashed with water to wake her up so that she can be, you know, fully conscious while she's being hung. Really brutal movie. Uh, The BBFC objected to the violence in the film, and critics were shocked by it, like this playwright Alan Bennett, who said that the film made him feel dirty, but, you know, that's part of the duty of horror movies. It's important to be reminded of the ugliness of humanity and actually feel some sort of uh, distinctive 
emotion beyond just happiness when you go to see a movie. Entertainment's not always about escapism, and I think this is one of those horror movies that taps into uh, the ugly, primitive nature of people. It was a big influence, obviously, clearly way ahead of its time, you know, when less than a decade later you have films like Ken Russell's The Devils. We're going to roll on into the next decade here, starting with several films from 1971. And first up at the bat is Dario Argento's Four Flies on Grey Velvet. This movie really, really rules. I was very surprised by this. I actually like it a lot better than The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, which is a much more popular movie, but I think this one's far better. You got a great score by Ennio Morricone. He had actually done the music for Argento's previous two movies, but they had a big argument over some of the songs in this movie, and they didn't end up working together until The Stondel Syndrome, about 25 years later. And lots of weird shit going on during the making of this movie. Uh, Argento thought about having Deep Purple do the soundtrack, and his casting ideas for the main character were insane, like Terrence Stamp and Michael York, Tom Courtney. That kind of makes sense. They're actors. He also thought about having James Taylor or Ringo Starr play the lead in this movie, and thank God that didn't work out. This was actually going to be his last Jalo. Uh, he wanted to uh, start taking a different turn in his career, but of course he made this period piece, The Five Days of Milan. It was a huge flop, so he went right back to making horror films again. An actress that I think doesn't get enough credit, Mimsy Farmer, she's in this movie. She plays the main character's wife, Nina, and... She kind of disappeared from movies. I was looking up the story about her, and it's really interesting. She was also in uh, films like Moore, The Devil's Angels, The Wild Racers, Perfume of the Lady in Black, uh, The Track, Bye Bye Monkey, Fulci's The Black Cat, Diodato's Body Count. Apparently she retired from acting in 1991, but she still does sculpting work for film with her husband. She actually did sculpting for Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette, and Guardians of the Galaxy, which is pretty crazy. It's excellent. I think one of Argento's best. One of my favorites, anyway. Keep it rolling through 1971 here. We got Philip Gilbert's Blood and Lace. This was Philip Gilbert's only movie. He vanished into thin air. You've got Gloria Graham here in this movie, who plays Mrs. Deer, the owner of the orphanage. Uh, she was in It's a Wonderful Life, In a Lonely Place, The Bad and the Beautiful, The Big Heat. And then later in her career, she would do films like The Todd Killings, Chilly Scenes of Winter, Melvin and Howard, The Nesting. Uh, you got Melody Patterson, plays the lead character in this movie, Ellie. She didn't really have a big career, but she's in a couple other notable movies like The Cycle Savages and The Immortalizer. But I think the coolest, low-key, recognizable face in this movie is Tom Cridge, the bad guy, uh, the handyman at the orphanage. Uh, the, the actor's name is Len Lesser. He's most famous for playing Uncle Leo on Seinfeld, but he was also in The Outlaw Josie Wales. And he got Vic Tayback from Bullet, Emperor of the North, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. So there's some really interesting character actors in this movie. And it's like a proto-slasher that was a big hit on the drive-in circuit for a while. Pretty graphic for a movie rated PG, but of course, PG in the 70s was, you know, you could get away with a lot more than you could now. And it's, you know, it's not anything to write home about. Pretty goofy homespun exploitation, but it's a pretty fun little flick. Moving through 1971 here, next up it's Harry Kermel's Daughters of Darkness. This is a great movie. One of the best vampire movies. In the 70s you had that trend with lots of lesbian vampire films, and this is part of that trend, but this is an excellent movie. John Carlin uh, is in this movie. He just passed away this year, and he's probably most recognizable to people because he was in over 100 episodes of Dark Shadows, playing Kendrick Young, Willie Loomis, Carl and Desmond Collins, but he was also in films like Trilogy of Terror, Pennies from Heaven, Surf Ninjas, mostly did TV work, but pretty cool actor. Delphine Seyrig, probably the most recognizable actress in this movie, you know, she's in films like Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, just a, just a classic French actress. And there's an excellent score in this film, some excellent, excellent photography by Edward van der Enden, and Harry Kermel would go on to make a movie called Malpertuis, with Orson Welles and Jean-Pierre Cassel. That's uh, Vincent Cassell's dad. Pretty interesting stuff going on here. I highly recommend this one. It's streaming on a lot of websites right now. And it's one of the best horror films of the 70s, so check that out. Some more 1971 here. It's Clint Eastwood's Play Misty for Me. And this was Clint Eastwood's directorial debut. Uh, he'd made a documentary short about the production of Don Siegel's The Beguiled, but this was his first big movie. And speaking of Don Siegel, his regular collaborator, he actually has a small cameo as the bartender that Clint Eastwood's character plays a game called Cry Bastion with at the bar. And another interesting thing about this movie, uh, there's live concert scenes at the Monterey Jazz Festival, which totally makes sense, because Eastwood's like a super uh, jazz fan. You know, he even made 
made a film about Charlie Parker called Bird with Forrest Whitaker. He produced this documentary about Dave Brubeck. So, of course, he had to throw some live jazz in the movie. Now, he works at this jazz station called KRML in Carmel-by-the-Sea, and that was a real radio station. Pretty fun little flick. Uh, Maybe dated to a lot of people for multiple reasons, but I thought it held up pretty well. And I think it's well worth checking out. Some more fun from 1971. We got Thomas Casey's Sometimes Aunt Martha Does Dreadful Things. And this is Florida exploitation at its finest. Uh, Florida, you know, gave us classic 70s exploitation like Blood Freak, Sting of Death, Blood Feast, Shanty Tramp. And this is right up there with those movies. It was Thomas Casey's only film. He also had worked on other films, but this is his only directorial credit. The actors in this movie aren't particularly recognizable, but there's a couple faces you'll probably know, like Wayne Crawford, uh, who plays Stanley. He uses the alias Scott Lawrence here. He was pretty much about the only actor to have a steady film career after this. He was also in God's Bloody Acre, Valley Girl, Jake Speed, Headhunter, but he also co-wrote and co-directed a movie called Barracuda. And this is just your average... Criminals on the run disguised and dragged to avoid the cops movie uh, about a couple of dudes who escape from Baltimore. They're hiding out in Miami. One of them is dressing as an old lady, uh, pretending to be the other guy's aunt, but he's actually in love with that guy, jealous of his relationship with other women. So he's killing all these poor women with a meat cleaver. One thing that made me laugh is that you know, they're supposed to be on the run from the cops, but they're in this really noticeable hippie van, and it's got the guy's fucking name over the passenger window, like, with him sitting in the van. Like, you're trying to get away from the cops, and you're in a really recognizable van with your name on it right above where you're sitting. That's pretty interesting. There's a really weird C-section that happens in this movie. Really good stuff. This is streaming on Hoopla and Amazon Prime right now, so check that out. We're going to stop off in 1971 for the last film here with The Fifth Chord by Luigi Batsoni. This is a pretty solid little movie. Not one of the best giallo films out there, but it's pretty neat. And Batsoni, he had directed another film with Franco Nero before, uh, this adaptation of the opera Carmen that was mismarketed in Italy called A Man, Pride, and Vengeance. We talked about one of his films, Footprints on the Moon, for the last Halloween show that we did. And uh, this is an interesting film worth checking out. Great Morricone score, as per usual. Uh, you got photography by Vittorio Storaro. He actually turned down the opportunity to shoot this film for Antonioni, called Technically Sweet. That movie would never get made. And he turned down that film out of respect for Luigi Bezzoni because Bezzoni helped him get his career started as an assistant on some short films that the director had made between 1963 and 1966. So Storaro felt that he helped him out so he wanted to help the director with his career and do him a favor. And this film, of course, knocks off several boxes on the Italian movie checklist. You got J&B bottles everywhere. You got a groovy score, some stylish photography, uh, occasionally awful dubbing, and of course, Franco Nero slapping the shit out of both men and women. Yep, it's an Italian movie. Really interesting. It's a pretty solid little mystery. We move now from 1971 into 1974, and we're going to talk about this Turkish film called Satan. The Turkish Exorcist. Holy mackerel, this is a horrible movie. The director had made uh, 42 films, shorts, and TV miniseries in the course of 30 years. And man, this is an absolute turd. I was hoping that this movie would be funny, like Turkish Star Wars, but it was it was brutal. Uh, and it is an absolute knockoff of The Exorcist. There were a lot of Exorcist knockoffs. This one's like a really subpar remake, you know, where they play tubular bells like every 30 seconds. Probably the funniest use of it is during a tennis game at one point in the movie. And whoever did the subtitles for this movie definitely had a good sense of humor. Maybe not the best grasp on the English language, but <laughs> the the subtitles having been made by somebody who clearly didn't like the movie is the one redeeming aspect of watching it. You know, there's like a there's like a scene where the mom is asking these housekeepers, "Who put this book opener in my daughter's room?" and there's a subtitle in parentheses at the bottom that says like "book opener?" question mark. Like, what the hell is a book opener? You know, it's not like a can opener. What anything's a book opener, really? It's pretty easy to open a book. In this version of the movie, the Father Karras role, instead of being a priest, is this author who wrote a book with a really horrible title. And uh, all the scenes that are classic in The Exorcist, when they try to do them here, it's just really, really bad. Like the scene where Reagan pisses on the floor at the party. Here it looks like soup coming out of her onto the floor. And like, you know, the quaking bed scenes, very obviously like someone pushing it up from underneath it. It doesn't really 
alternate from The Exorcist much. I mean, there's a cop in this movie who isn't in The Exorcist, and he has no reason really to be in this movie because all he ever does is pop up smoking a cigar and ask people questions once in a while. It does have one advantage over The Exorcist. In The Exorcist, you don't get to see the priest punching out the possessed girl after killing that other priest, you know, Max von Sydow. <laughs> in this film, he's like throwing punches left and right. That's uh, in the classic Turkish tradition. Yeah, not a good film. I don't recommend it. It is streaming on Tubi, and God forgive you if you have the strength to get through all 100 minutes of it. Also from 1974, we got Paul Maslansky's Sugar Hill. This is a pretty cool little movie. Uh, one of those black exploitation horror films from the 70s, like uh, Blackula or The House on Skull Mountain. This was the director's only film. He'd produced several other films, but this was the only one he directed. The main actor who plays Sugar Hill, Marky Bay, She's really only in five movies, and the most notable one is uh, her debut, Hal Ashby's The Landlord. Nowadays, she's not acting anymore. She operates murder mystery cruises in L.A., which is pretty neat. But the highlight of this movie, definitely Don Pedro Colley, the actor who plays Baron Samdi, who was also in Beneath the Planet of the Apes, THX 1138, Black Caesar. He did an episode of Night Gallery. You've also got some other actors like Zara Coley, who plays Sugar Hill's mom. She was in Darktown Strutters. Uh, Charles Robinson, who plays... The bad guy's henchman, Fabulous. That really is his name, Fabulous, but it's pronounced Fabulous. Uh, he was also in Drive, He Said, The Black Gestapo, Set It Off. Uh, Robert Quarry plays the, the classic ornery white guy, bad guy that you have to have in every black exploitation movie. He was Count Yorga in the Count Yorga films. Richard Lawson here, he plays the cop. He was also in uh, Coming Home. And I think the cool thing about this movie for me, it was shot in Houston, Texas. There's a part where they go to a voodoo museum, and that's actually the Heights branch of the Houston Library, which is like a big historical landmark over there. So I thought that was pretty cool. Kino Lorber put this out on Blu-ray not long ago. I suggest checking that out. Really underrated movie. Uh, I didn't enjoy it as much as JD's Revenge, but it is a really cool film. Next up, two films from 1977. We're going to start off with Deathbed, The Bed That Eats by George Berry. This was George Berry's only movie, filmed in Detroit in 1972. Tried to find a distributor in 1977, didn't have any luck, and then in 2001, the director found out people were bootlegging his movie and sharing it on the internet because he found an article about it online. <laughs> and, you know, this movie, for a stupid movie about a killer bed, it's surprisingly pretty well made. There's some pretty cool photography in here. It's really trippy. Uh, maybe it's just all the years of hallucinogen and marijuana abuse that have destroyed my brain that are making me say that I thought this movie was really cool, but you know what? I did. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> Pretty fun little movie. I, You know, it was a very pleasant surprise to me. I really like Deathbed. The next movie was not a pleasant surprise. Kingdom of the Spiders, John Bud Cardos from 1977. Whew! Boy, this movie sucks. Uh, it plays out like... An uninspired TV movie. The second half is a lot better than the first half because you've got a lady uh, shooting off her own fingers to get a spider off of her. you got a cop crashing into a telephone pole and being crushed in his car. Uh, William Shatner throws a kid on the floor uh, for no reason. He's trying to stop the kid from being covered in spiders, but he throws the kid on the floor so it can get covered in spiders. I thought it was pretty interesting that the end of this movie was suddenly animated, probably because they spent all their budget on spiders supposedly they spent 50 grand on the spiders in this movie and so the last two shots of the movie are literally just animated stills pretty damn cheap not much to say about this one although you do have the awesome woody strode from once upon a time in the west vigilante tons of other great films you've also got tiffany bowling who was in bonnie's kids the candy snatchers open house so eh i don't know i guess you could do worse but you shouldn't have to try also, shout out to Whitey Hughes, who plays the shrieking plane pilot who crashes. He was a stuntman on over 200 films, mostly uncredited, lots of horse operas, worked with Peckinpah several times. He did stunts for the Omega Man, Serpico, Dillinger. Shout out to Whitey Hughes. Next up, last film of the 70s, it's 1978, The Toolbox Murders, directed by Dennis Donnelly. This was his only non-TV credit, and of course, this is one of the notorious films from the UK's video nasty list. It's a pretty gruesome, unpleasant little movie, one of Stephen King's favorite horror films. You can't talk about this movie without giving big shouts to B-movie icon Cameron Mitchell, the man, over 200 acting credits. 
Not all of them bad. He was in legitimately good movies like Sam Fuller's House of Bamboo, Helen Highwater, Sergio Corbucci's Minnesota Clay, Mario Bava's Knives of the Avenger, Monty Hellman's Ride in the Whirlwind. But then he also did films like Haunts, The Swarm, Silent Scream, Without Warning, Raw Force, Bloodlink, Night Train to Terror, <laughs> Hollywood Cop, Deadly Prey, Space Mutiny, Action USA, Demon Cop. <laughs> so, you gotta love Cameron Mitchell. He's a legend. Got Gary Graver shot this movie. He worked with Orson Welles, also made lots of porno, wrote, directed, and shot Trick or Treats, the 80s movie. One of my favorite scenes in this movie is this guy throwing a dildo at another guy. You've also got Cameron Mitchell uh, singing to a kidnapping victim. Not just once, but several times. First he sings about lollipops, and then he sings, I feel like a motherless child. And you know, we, we've all felt that way at some point, so good for you, Cameron. I mean, the killer's a Bible thumper uh, who's freaked out by female masturbation, so you know you gotta see this movie. And they try to claim it was based on a true story at the end. It was influenced by a real killer, I think from Michigan, somewhere around there. We're gonna jump into the 1980s here now, and the 1980s are always the biggest part of my list. Love 80s horror, watch a lot of 80s horror movies, something about them just does it for me, I don't know. But we're gonna start off here with a really weird one, Egyptian film called Fangs also known as Anyab, from 1981 by Mohamed Shebel. Uh, this was Mohamed Shebel's first film. He only made four movies. One of them has a great title, Love and Revenge, with a meat cleaver. And uh, this is basically, it starts off like a Rocky Horror ripoff. Uh, Bleeding Skull wrote about this movie, and I just discovered it because Cinephobe played it on their stream not long ago. Like, I mean, it's you got a close-up on red lips singing. There's a newlywed couple on their honeymoon, stodgy dude reading from a book. Uh, their car breaks down in the rain. They end up at a at a mansion singing "Where's the Light." Yeah, this, it starts off as a Rocky Horror ripoff, but then they get to this big banquet and there's these dancers and it just becomes totally ridiculous. You know, there's a vampire that withdraws and drinks its own blood. Uh, blatant theft of the Pink Panther and James Bond music, as well as the Jaws theme song and the Fistful of Dollars theme song. There's a sequence that goes on way too fucking long of Prince Dracula tricking the couple by pretending to be a doctor, a mechanic, a cabbie, a teacher, an apartment guide. goes on for like 40 minutes and it's way too much. There's a fucking Clockwork Orange parody out of nowhere. Hitler footage that turns into an art film spoof. Yeah, this movie's weird as fuck. There's a Batman parody. Check this shit out, dude. If you like Bollywood, if you like 70s Turkish movies, watch Fangs. Highly recommended. Next up, another sleaze classic. It's 1981's Nightmare by Romano Scavellini, also known as Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. This is infamous because it was one of the UK video nasties, but it's definitely the most infamous video nasty since David Hamilton Grant, the original distributor, actually went to jail for six months for releasing an uncut version of this movie with 60 seconds of footage that the BBFC wanted trimmed. And yep, this is a nasty Grim, gross, sleazy, slimy little movie. Excellent. If you enjoy uh, William Lustig's Maniac, Don't Go in the House, The Last House on Dead End Street, watch this movie. Hilariously enough, they actually submitted uh, this film to the 1982 Academy Awards in the hopes that they would get a Best Screenplay nomination. But nothing came of that. I wonder why. And, you know, the director, Scavellini, he'd made a lot of other films before this, and he'd already been in trouble with the Italian censors over a film he made in 66 called The Blind Fly, and this is just a really scuzzy, unforgettable movie. Highly recommended. Excellent movie. Next up, 1981, it's The Hand by Oliver Stone with Sir Michael Caine. And Michael Caine, no stranger to paycheck movies. He was in Jaws the Revenge and gave this classic quote. He said, I have never seen it, but by all accounts it is terrible. However, I have seen the house that it built, and it is terrific. So... <laughs> So Michael Caine, no stranger to the Paycheck movie, and this is one of them. But I actually really enjoyed this movie. It's uh, one of a couple movies that are on the list about cartoonists. A lot of similarities with Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, the Christopher Lee story in that movie that I talked about earlier. Michael Caine pretty much said he did this movie to finance a garage that he was having built, and he took the role after John Foyt, Christopher Walken, Dustin Hoffman already turned it down. You know, this is a pretty fun little movie. It's a B-movie, for sure, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, I would rather watch this than two-thirds of Oliver Stone's other movies. I'll say that. He actually has a cameo as a homeless guy who's also missing a hand. And you've got some other recognizable actors here. Pat Corley, uh, who is the voice of Mr. Camacho on Hey Arnold. He's in this movie. you got Annie McEnroe, who plays the college student. Stella, she was in Beetlejuice. Andrea Marcovici, who plays Michael Caine's wife in this movie. She was in The Stuff. you got Bruce McGill, uh, who was in The Last Boy Scout. 
Vivica Lindfors, who's this doctor in one scene toward the end of the movie. She was in Creep Show. She was Aunt Bedelia. And of course, the legendary Tracy Walter, with his one-line cameo as a police officer from Repo Man. Tracy Walter, one of my favorite character actors, for sure. So check this movie out. It's goofy as hell, but it's pretty fun. Next up, from 1981, I rewatched The Pit with a friend of mine who hadn't seen it before. I won't say much about this movie, uh, but I had already seen it before, and the second viewing held up. I still liked it a lot. I thought it was hilarious. This is one of those weird Ken exploitation movies, you know, from our friends in Canada. And I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people don't like this movie. I thought it was pretty fun. The actress who plays the babysitter, uh, Jeannie Elias, she would voice the mom on the Oblongs and would do a lot of other cartoon work and video game voiceovers for stuff like, uh, you know, Psychonauts and uh, Dark Cloud 2. So there's a really great disassembled bike prank in this movie. That's cool. And if you want some awkward trivia... The director's wife refused to let him shoot the nude scenes, so the screenwriter shot them instead. But the only shot involving nudity the director was allowed to film was the skinny dipping scene. Why? Because the actress was his daughter. Uh, yikes! So there you go, The Pit, 1981. Canada at its finest. Check that out. Next up, 1982, we got a pretty obscure little Shaw Brothers movie by Chung Soon called Human Lanterns. Now, the director had made several films for the Shaw Brothers, uh, kung fu flicks like The Avenging Eagle, but then other films like The Sexy Killer, Fangs of the Cobra. You got Tony Liu in this movie, who plays Lung, and Lung is in this perpetual beef with another character named Tan. Uh, Lung and Tan are fighting over, you know, who's going to make the best lantern, which doesn't sound like the best setup for a horror movie, but it takes you there. And Tony Liu, the actor who plays Lung, he was in The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, did over 70 movies, lots of stuff. Quan Tai Chen plays Tan, he was also in The Flying Guillotine from 75, Executioners from Shaolin recently, he was in The Man with the Iron Fist. Uh, you got this actress named Ni Tien, who plays Lung's wife, she was in Hex, Black Magic 1 and 2, Corpse Mania, Cleopatra Jones in the Casino of Gold, and of course the bad guy, very recognizable, Lo Lie, he was in Dangerous Encounters of the First Kind, 36th Chamber of Shaolin, Buddha's Palm, did several Jackie Chan films like Super Cop, Dragons Forever, Miracles. This is an interesting movie. I think there was a little bit too much exposition. I could have used a little bit more kung fu and horror weirdness. But if you enjoy weird Shaw Brothers movies like Boxer's Omen or The Oily Maniac, check it out. Why not? It's pretty gruesome in parts. Next up, 1982, we've got Lucio Fulci's Manhattan Baby. This is a fun one, not one of Fulci's best. Apparently the budget got slashed during the production, and uh, this really pissed off Fulci, so he stopped making films for the producer Fabrizio De Angelis. But I enjoyed this stupid little movie. It was shot in Cairo, shot in Rome and New York. You got another Fabio Fritzi score with some really funny saxophone in it, and of course they use the saxophone every time it cuts to New York footage. Because, you know, New York's alright if you like saxophones. But this movie also recycles music from the beyond and City of the Living Dead. And of course, oh boy, get ready. You all loved Bob and House by the Cemetery, right? Well, that actor, Giovanni Frezza, he's here again. And he plays Tommy. He was also in the new Barbarians, Demons, Blade in the Dark. <laughs> People hate that kid, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think he's pretty funny. And you've also got the main actor, Christopher Connolly. He was in Benji, and he would end up in several Italian films like Bruno Mattei's Strike Commando and Antonio Margariti's Jungle Raiders. Uh, this movie is super implausible. Lots of things don't make sense. There's a guy who's like bleeding from every orifice in his head, and then suddenly he's having a gentle conversation with the professor. You know, kid gets sucked into a glowing portal door, and then he's back like two seconds later. Uh, chick sees her friend disappear, and there's sand all over the room. And then she's like, okay, kids, what do you want for dinner? But, uh, you know, you do get lots of snake attacks. It's not too bloody. They save most of the gore for the end when there's a pretty gruesome bird attack. Like I said, not one of Fulci's best, but pretty fun. I don't know. Check it out. Next up, from 1983, obscure little Greek film from Nikos Zervos called Dracula of Exarchia. And it's a film that starts off with Dracula, and he's more of a mad scientist than a vampire. He's telling his driver to play the Remain in Light album by talking heads when they pull up to this graveyard. And they dig up some corpses. They're trying to make a rock band from the body parts of these corpses. They get scared out of the graveyard, and we see these zombies. The zombies in the graveyard are trying to organize a union against necrophiliacs. They plan on putting on a concert. Which they do, at the end of the film. Dracula's daughter, uh, whose name is Sharon in this movie, you get to see her hump a doll, because she doesn't like the mate that her father's provided for her. Meanwhile, there's a maid who does some very phallic vacuuming. And uh, the zombie band, they do, you know, Dracula does make his zombie band. They're called the Music Brigades. And the singer is this famous musician-comedian from Greece called Simus Panousis. 
He runs off with Dracula's daughter. There's a hilarious sequence with this feminist meeting where the term vulvocracy gets used at one point, and the meeting takes place at a male bodybuilder competition that, like, devolves into a total fuckfest after police try to raid the scene. Just ridiculous. This movie does not make a whole lot of sense, but it's pretty damn funny. Uh, the English subtitles cannot be accurate. Like, during one of the songs, you hear the lyric, You bought me a DVD starring Brad Pitt. This is a movie from 1983, so... I don't know what the fuck's going on there. If you're looking for something weird and obscure, this will hit the ticket. Check it out. Also from 1983, Scalps by Fred Olin Ray. Holy mackerel, this movie sucks. I know people love it. I was not much of a fan, but Fred Olin Ray definitely is a B-movie icon. He's made over 150 flicks since 1978, like Biohazard, Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, Bad Girls from Mars, Evil Tunes, and you know, I don't know, there's some decent things about it. You got Forrest Ackerman. He's got a small role in this movie. Apparently, Fred Olin Ray has some beef with 21st Century Film Corporation because they re-edited the movie without his consent. And, uh, you know, they put spoilers at the beginning, did overlays of this ghost head, stuck in some lion head footage that was actually supposed to be just, like, test shots. But, you know, the stuff they did, I actually kind of like. So I'm going to have to side with 21st Century over Fred Olin Ray in this case. And here's a fun fact about the movie. Where they shot it, it's on this ranch that is now owned by Alice Cooper. So... At least somebody got something out of this movie. Not a lot of scalping in a movie called Scalps, though. So, I guess that tells you all you really need to know. Next up, very little-known anthology horror film from 1985 called Southern Shockers by David Coleman. Filmed in West Point, Mississippi. And interestingly enough, this movie only ever received an official VHS release in Spain, so you get to see all these people from Mississippi dubbed in Spanish. This is uh, not one of the best anthology horror movies. Not really a very good anthology horror movie. Starts off with this impatient, obnoxious guy in a diner who tags along with these other two people at the diner to go to church, but they show up late, which annoys the preacher. He crumples up the sermon he prepared about forgiveness. The first story does not make sense at all. There might have been something I missed. Definitely the worst of the bunch. It's about a doctor who arrives in a small town, has weird run-ins with the locals, and then he gets chased to a corpse and forced to touch it. That's it. Second story is about a moonshiner who brews up this bad batch, melts his hand, kills his dog, still sells a couple jars to some local yokels who die from it. They come back as zombies and wreak their wrath upon him. He thinks he's tripping from that good homebrew and then he gets killed. That one's pretty fun. Third story is pretty solid. It's about that guy from the diner who's a pain in the ass. Uh, he's obsessed with his car. And he runs this old guy in a Nissan off the road. And then the Grim Reaper shows up out of nowhere and fucking races him in a hearse. Runs him off the road. Chases him through a scrapyard. Kills him. And I had to laugh because the Grim Reaper keeps a death tally on his sun visor. And he sticks the dude's severed head on his hood as an ornament. Yeah, this isn't a, a particularly good movie. But it's hard to find. And apparently most of the people involved in it haven't even seen it. So, I don't know. Why not check it out? I've seen worse. Next up, 1986, Ken Russell's Gothic. The whole movie plays out like a pretentious, laudanum-induced sex party. Not that that's a bad thing. It's also not necessarily historically accurate, but there's a bunch of tongue-in-cheek references to the people involved, you know, through the dialogue and other literary references. And this is, I mean, it's a Ken Russell movie, so you watch it just to see crazy shit. More an examination of imagination running wild, you know, the madness behind artistic inspiration. Definitely not a straightforward kind of biopic. And it's got plenty of trademark Ken Russell weirdness, like uh, breasts with eyeball nipples, Bigfoot on horseback, vampirism, self-mutilation. Worth seeing. Uh, Timothy Spall and Gabriel Byrne have pretty good roles in it. I didn't love it, but I'm glad I saw it. Next up, 976 Evil from 1988 directed by Robert England, and um, my buddy Justin talked about this on episode 4 of our show here, so I won't say too much about it, he's the one who showed it to me yesterday. I will say a highlight of this movie, Sandy Dennis steals the movie, she plays the religious wacko mom, and I did not, I knew I recognized her face, but I couldn't tell who it was, she was the one half of the young couple from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, she's also in uh, God Told Me To, Bob Balaban's parents, a couple Robert Altman movies. She's done a lot of interesting work, but she steals the movie here. She's terrific. I'd watch a whole movie about that crazy religious mom. You also got Patrick O'Brien, who plays Spike. He really only made a handful of films like William Lustig's Relentless and the, the Hulk Hogan masterpiece No Holds Barred. Dookie! This film would actually kind of predict the end of his career. His last movie was 976 Evil 2, directed by Jim Wynorski three years later. Now, Stephen Jeffries is in this movie. He kind of, he ends up being the main character, which is a 
Interesting little turn of pace. He was also in Fraternity Vacation, Fright Night, At Close Range, and within a year after making this movie would start appearing in gay porn under aliases like Larry Burt, Sam Ritter, and Stephen Bordeaux. Poor Stephen Jeffries, man. You also got one of my favorite character actors, Robert Picardo, as the unexpected bad guy, Mark Dark. And he's got over 200 credits as an actor, probably most famous for Star Trek. But he's also been in great movies like Get Crazy, Star 80, Motorama. He's worked with Joe Dante several times. This movie is alright. It veers a little bit too far into Nightmare on Elm Street territory for me with the one-liners and ridiculous kills. But I enjoyed it. Pretty fun little movie. Next up, another movie I won't say too much about. Already discussed on the second episode of the show, that's Hack O' Lantern by Jag Mundra. You may recall that when I talked about this a couple years ago in the second episode of the podcast, I fucking hated it. But you know what? I've kind of come around on this stupid little movie. I watched it again, was not excited to see it a second time. Joe Bob Briggs played it for the last drive-in, and I was very reluctant to have to sit through this movie again, but it made me laugh pretty hard. I don't know if it was seeing it with other people, because the first time I watched it on my own or what, but I did end up enjoying this stupid movie, so you have my word. I'm sorry, Jag Mundra, if I hurt you with what I said about this movie before. I think he's dead, so he probably didn't hear it anyway. Talk about a couple more movies from 1988. Next up, it's George Romero's Monkey Shines. This is a movie that I just never got around to, finally saw for the first time, and really liked, actually. I thought this movie was pretty solid. I think a lot of Romero's other films get overshadowed by the zombie trilogy that he did, but this one's really, really good. Definitely worth seeing. Shout Factory put out a Blu-ray not long ago. And, you know, this is a pretty fun little movie. Orion was having financial troubles when they distributed this. They insisted on a happy ending and recut the film, which kind of pissed off Romero. They put in this shock moment with a monkey coming out of a guy's back, but... I don't know, I enjoyed that stuff. It was stupid, but it made me smile. So, I don't know. I really liked Monkey Shines. Check it out. Last film of 88 here. It's William Wesley's Scarecrows. Uh, some recognizable actors here. You got Richard Vidan, who was in Hard Rock Zombies. David Campbell from Killer Workout, Population 1. B.J. Turner who was an alien private eye. Here's one fun thing about this movie. It was shot by Peter Deming. Now, if you don't recognize that name, he's shot a lot of films you've probably seen, like Evil Dead 2, Hollywood Shuffle, Drop Dead Fred, My Cousin Vinny, Joe's Apartment, The Cabin in the Woods. But most notably, he's worked with David Lynch on several projects. He shot all 18 episodes of the third season of Twin Peaks. He also shot Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive. And, you know, it's this is a movie that is really, really good. I like it a lot. It's got some good gore, cool kills, good sense of atmosphere. Acting isn't the best, but it's got a neat little crime story setup, kind of like Beast from Haunted Cave, although much better. I really recommend Scarecrows, one of the best horror movies of the 80s. I thought it was terrific. A couple more films from 1989 here. We're going to start off with Beware, Children at Play by Mick Cribben. And this is a pretty fun little movie, I gotta say. I really like this. Uh, one of the better trauma efforts, I've gotta say. The lead actor, Michael Robertson. You know you know you're in for a good time because his name is incorrectly given as Michael Robinson during the opening credits. And the director, Mick Cribben, he actually plays the farmer Isaac, who leads the massacre on the kids at the end of the film. Now, Lloyd Kaufman claims that people walked out on the trailer for this movie at the Cannes Film Festival because of the footage of kid murder, but this is the same guy who locked people in at a screening of Troma's War, so I don't know how much of his word you can take seriously. Basic story, Dad takes his son camping, tells him the Beowulf story, gets stuck in a bear trap, goes crazy and dies, leaves the kid to survive in the woods, he starts Cannibal Child Cult. You know, that story. Brutal little movie here. You got a crooked Bible salesman named Ludwig who gets scythed in half. Uh, you got people who don't know that there is no plural for the word cleavage because they keep grilling this writer about cleavages on the covers of his books. You know, it takes place in Pine Barrens, New Jersey. There's no Russians in it, though, so don't get excited. Uh, you got classic pie theft from a windowsill. A sheriff who doesn't know how to pronounce the word Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, check this fucking movie out. I thought it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Another trauma release from 1989, The House on Tombstone Hill, directed by Jay Riffle. Now, this was completed in 1988 with the title The Dead Come Home, but it wasn't released until 1991 by uh, AIP Home Video and Trauma Team on a collaboration. Trauma would end up re-releasing the film on their own label without AIP, but they changed the title to Dead Dudes in the House and used actors on the cover that don't appear in the film, trying to sell it as, like, a hip-hop movie, I guess, to cash in on House Party or something like that. Pretty hilarious. Also pretty stupid and terrible, so classic drama. The director, James Riffle, uh, he directed some other stuff like Black Eyed Susan, 
Jews and massive angels. Uh, he made a Howard Stern video documentary. Did some uncredited music for an episode of uh, this cartoon, The Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries. Um, you got Makeup by Ed French, who did the effects on Dead Time Stories and Nightlife. And Bruce Spalding Fuller, who was the makeup artist on the Rejuvenator Army of Darkness. Oh, uh, you know, this is... Pretty fun little movie. Vinegar Syndrome put out a Blu-ray not long ago. It's got this really funny opening scene with a nice panning shot. Tons of gore. Yeah, this one's pretty fun. Not great, but worth seeing. And it's got a glowing recommendation from Film Threat Magazine, so you know you can't go wrong there. Finish out the 80s here with a film I've already talked about on the podcast. That's Andrew Jordan's Things from 1989. And as you know, I'm a huge fan of this movie. I talked about it in the second episode of the show. So I won't say too much here. I've seen this movie six times. That's five times more than most rational people, and I'm always going to recommend it. I love this stupid movie. It's hilarious. Watch things. It's currently streaming on Tubi. You got nothing to lose. But I recommend buying the Intervision DVD. We move now into the 90s. We're going to start off with another anthology horror film from 1990 called Final Destinations. This is a pretty obscure little movie. It's got four segments centered on traveling and the open road. And two of the stories in this movie were actually recycled for other movies. The third story, Groovy Ghoulie Garage, was also in Creep Tales. Then the fourth story, The Visitant, by Paul Bunnell, was also in the 1986 Vidcrest anthology, Strange Tales. You get two stories you haven't seen and two you have seen if you watch a lot of these movies. Not a great movie. The first story is about like a troubled couple on the road who run into an escaped mental patient. Uh, the highlight of this first story is you get to hear this guy calling another guy a stupid head several times. That's pretty funny. Second story, Roadkill. Pretty much dialogue free. It's like a post apocalyptic story. Guy in a Davy Crockett hat talking to a headless corpse. The story didn't make a lot of sense. But it does have some hilarious credits where they list the two killers as first mean guy and other mean guy. And then you got the other two stories, which you've seen in other movies, if you have seen Creep Tales and Strange Tales. The Visitant is probably the best story in this movie. Directed by Paul Bunnell, who also directed the best segment of the horrible movie, Terrifying Tales. You know, if you like anthologies, watch it. But it's nothing to write home about. It's more of a compilation film than an anthology, really, because there's no wraparounds and each individual, you know, story has its own credit sequence. So, there you have it. Next up for 1992, we've got our second special guest speaker for the show, and it's going to be Shay Mosfin from Black Video. Take it away, Shay. Thanks for having me. I'm here to talk about Star Time from 92. It's the directorial debut of Alexander Cassini, whose only other credit is a full moon family feature called The Incredible Genie. Star Time came out in 92, but it feels a lot like 89, and stars John P. Ryan, who is the Davis father from It's Alive, as well as a familiar face that maybe you'd recognize as the doe-eyed heartthrob Link Larkin from the John Waters film Hairspray. He's a mentally unstable TV-obsessed serial killer. Star Time came into my life in the form of a tape at a thrift shop. The cover with St. Gerard in a baby mask with an axe, like ready to drop, <laughs> really gives off a slasher vibe. But it plays out as more of a psychological 90s noir thriller with an art house character study to boot. It has a high body count, most of which they never really show. But they do show abstractions and mental landscapes over a sparse soundtrack that sounds like an unreleased jam session between John Zorn and Angelo Badalamente. Star Time was literally an art house film that was sent straight to the Sundance, where it landed a home video release on Monarch Home Video, but it fell into relative obscurity, like it landed on the shelves of thrift shops, <laughs> for the most part, until its recent Blu-ray reissue on Vinegar Syndrome. It can be a tough one to follow because... The audience is immediately thrust into the world of a schizophrenic man who is unraveling on the streets of L.A. I guess it's just not as common for a slasher to tell the story from the antagonist's perspective. Sometimes audiences even resent that. Like a really common criticism of Rob Zombie's Halloween is the backstory of the abuse of Michael Myers. And that's also the case with the remake of Black Christmas. And even a more lighthearted, like, black comedy, like Leslie Vernon's Behind the Mask, rubbed fans the wrong way. I thought it was fun. But truth is, sometimes it works. Like with Fade to Black. That's a great example. That's almost a, a perfect movie. And I think Cassini was trying to do something different by going behind the mask and even further, behind Henry's very own face, like into his head. If this were done differently, we might be following an entirely different set of characters as a freak in a baby mask appears and chops the scream queens to mincemeat. The final girl might have been the social worker. 
There may have been no indication that Henry was anything more than a shape. So based mostly at night, Star Time has expressionist lighting, which blends reality with fantasy. The sets become mind frames, like delusions of grandeur take the form of dozens of TV screens. And there's cross editing that seems to jump through time. It's like hard to tell if we're in a room or if we're in a, uh, you know, somewhere in his head. <laughs> it's just, you know, is it yesterday? Is it today? What time is it? <laughs> So star time could be seen as a hard look in the mouth of screen culture, where a lonely person can bond to a screen like a bird to a mirror. Henry didn't have a family, only a TV sitcom. Star time takes themes explored in other films and layers those themes into a very dense sandwich. And because of this, it's going to be a different sandwich depending on where you bite it. Like the fanatical obsession explored in Der Fan, a brilliant movie from Germany, when Henry decides his life is meaningless without the Robertsons family. Or a loner in a sea of people driven to violent and deluded heroics like Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. The bleak downward spiraling of Henry in Eraserhead. Star Time brings something new though. It's kind of a, just a weird movie. <laughs> it's urban noir but it's also an internal landscape powered by the glow of late night TV. It's kind of just a vibe. Reality and fantasy blend seamlessly. I think that what some people view as strengths in this movie, others see as weaknesses. I have a friend who, like me, didn't know what to think about Star Time, but he kept thinking about it. You might find something to enjoy in Star Time. So that was Shay Mosfin, and we're going to have another special guest speaker coming up here for our 1995 film. That's Henry Crinkle from the eighth episode of the Video Psychosis podcast. Take it away, Henry. The movie I picked as a film you need to see for Halloween is Bruno Matai's Cruel Jaws from 1995. What stands out about this film is that it holds the distinction for being the most brazen of the Jaws rip. Takes them like Grizzly or Alligator Piranha, although... Those last two were more parodies than anything. Yeah, they obviously take the basic rooms to Jaws, and, but they do at least bother to change the animal. Then there is the last shark, which uses the same setup and doesn't even bother to change the animal. Now, the last shark famously being the, you know, the move that Universal sued over and was successful in blocking its distribution in the United States. Just for a circle of context, this being the time when Universal was being particularly litigious, as seen them suing Nintendo over Donkey Kong, and trying to sue Roger Corman of Piranha before Spielberg stepped in and blocked it. Spielberg was actually a big fan of Joe Dante and of Piranha in particular. The last shark was actually known as Jaws 3 in several countries, including Spain, this being before the actual Jaws 3 came out, and if you're wondering, yes, it is a better move than the actual Jaws 3. But Cruel Jaws up this by including the actual footage from not the last shark, as well as Deep Blood, another Italian Jaws ripoff, but also the first two Jaws films. It's in many ways the most representative film of Matthias' work because it's so just how far he's willing to go, and it's a perfectly entertaining film to boot. It was actually known as Jaws 5 in several areas around the world, and it includes a Hulk Hogan lookalike, which is something you can't go wrong with. And even it contains the line, we're going to need a bigger helicopter. Surprisingly, this Italian slice of blatant copyright violation was recently released on Blu-ray. So no more buying a bootleg or trying to import a D the DVD from Italy. And it's a film that all trash film fans need to see. You can all be finally seen completely legally in all its glory in the United States. If anything, just to see how it followed just how far Matthias wanted to go. And that is why Cruel Jaws is my pick for a movie you need to see this Halloween. So that was Henry Crinkle talking about Bruno Matai's Cruel Jaws. Really funny movie. I definitely recommend checking that out. We're going to move now into another film from 1995. That's Steve Latshaw's Jacko. I don't have a whole lot to say about this movie. Who knows? I said that I came around on Hacko Lantern, and maybe I'll see Jacko again in six years and feel differently than I do now, but as it stands, I really don't understand the hype on this movie. VHS collectors, they love it. It's one of six films that Steve Latshaw made along with Vampire Trailer Park and the sequel to Biohazard called The Alien Force. You've got Linnea Quigley and other known trash regulars like Brink Stevens from Slumber Party Massacre, Don Wildsmith from Star Slammer, and you also have John Carradine and Cameron Mitchell, both actors of which died before the film was released. Carradine's footage was filmed in 85. Looks like it was taken from another film, but it actually isn't. There's a pretty obvious double form in one of the shots. Most of the movie was filmed in 93, partially shot in the director's own house with his own son in an acting role as the protagonist Sean. The director also plays the cable installer in this movie. One question you will have after seeing this movie is why the killer uses a scythe to kill people 
but only slices their necks. Doesn't that seem kind of like a waste of a scythe? I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I wasn't a huge fan of this movie, but like I said, who knows? Maybe I'll watch it again in two or three years and say it was great, but it didn't do much for me, sadly. So we're going to go into the next film on the list here now, and that's We Await directed by Charles Pinion from 1996. I've talked about Charles Pinion on the show before, Twisted Issues, American Mummy, I mentioned Red Spirit Lake, which is also a great movie. This is a great movie. You have to see this movie. If you go to Charles Pinion's website, charlespinion.com, which is pretty much his site advertising the films he released under his own Inferential Pictures label, you can buy this film. The DVD is available for $20, or you can get his first three films for $50, which is a great deal. They have great extras. They come with artwork that he's done. He autographs them. They come with making of shorts, trailers, short film, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. And Charles Pinion's a director who refers to his own films more as psychotronic madness than any kind of generic horror films. One thing that's worth noting about this film, there's a really insane sequence where the characters take a spirit drive. They drive their, like, funky old car through this crazy backdrop, rear projection madness, like, you know, footage of, like, amoeba and, like, cells and galactic footage in the background, and then they meet this gigantic, like, you know, giant version of Jesus, which is actually played by porno director David Aaron Clark, who made films like Zen and the Art of Fellatio and the classic Taste My Asian Ass. So... Yeah, this is a must-see movie. It's actually really good. I highly recommend this. There's a really interesting use of music. It flashes back and forth between, like, gospel instrumentals, opera music, mariachi music. There's the kind of heavy thrash rock you expect from a Charles Pinion film. Then you've also got, like, an Eddie Arnold song in there. And Frank Henenlotter is a big fan of this film. He issued this film as well as Red Spirit Lake on video for something weird under the title Sexy Shockers from the Video Underground. And you know what? He's absolutely right. This is a great movie. Must see underground film. Check it out. I highly recommend buying a DVD of this excellent film. Really trippy, really weird, really funny. Definitely memorable. I think you'll love it. Give it a look. Next film on the list, The Necrophiles from 1997 by Matt Jassel. And we already talked about this on the second episode of the show, so I won't say too much about it. I still love it. Still give you a glowing recommendation of it. Check this movie out. It's absolutely hilarious. And Matt Jassel actually started following the Video Psychosis page on Facebook earlier this year. So thanks to Matt for that. We love his movies. You should check out Back From Hell, Legion of the Night. He just made a new film called The Detroit Driller Killer, so give that a look too. I recommend The Necrophiles. If you live in Washington, it's a Washington State classic. And if you don't, it's a really fun trashy shot on video movie. Speaking of trashy shot on video movies, we're going to move into the next film that's Bad Magic from 1998 by the Polonia brothers, John and Mark Polonia. These guys are shot on video legends. John passed away about 12 years ago in 2008, but Mark is still making movies. And, you know, they started out with flicks like Church of the Damned, Hallucinations, Splatter Farm, Saurians. They made both of the Feeders films. This was released after Feeders 2, but it's way better. You can stream this on Tubi right now, and you've got to see it. I highly recommend Bad Magic. Super funny movie. Uh, It's about a guy whose brother was killed by the cops after being lured into a trap by his gang cohorts. And the gang in question is called the Red Claws. Probably the lamest gang you'll ever see in a movie. It's a bunch of middle-aged white dudes in black leather jackets. So the guy vows revenge, researches voodoo, and uh, ends up flying to the West Indies to see a witch doctor named Tabanga, whose office kind of looks like the set for Between Two Ferns, so that he can get that voodoo magic to get revenge for his dead brother. And he finds out about a spirit called Blaki Blake, drinks the spirit's blood, gets some artifacts that give him powers like a garden claw. That's actually a poison claw, apparently. You know, he goes home to his house, which is obviously just some office in some building somewhere, sort of looks like a room you would see in a guidance counselor's office or a parole officer's workplace. There's a no smoking sign on the wall. And the spirit of Blaki Blake comes alive, helps Rennie with his revenge, you got a gangbanger named Ajax, possible Warriors reference, I don't know. He's pimping out a woman named Calico, and John Polonia has a cameo as the John. So that's a <laughs> little tongue-in-cheek there. She gets killed with a voodoo doll. You got some great dialogue, like one of the gangbangers saying, Don't call me a cheese licker. And uh, probably my favorite scene in the movie, an out-of-body experience where the protagonist wraps one of the bad guys in toilet paper, calls him a bitch, and then telekinetically sends flying knives at him while he's on the toilet. Excellent movie. Check this out. It's absolutely hilarious. 
Highly recommend this movie. Next film from 1999, that's Shinya Tsukamoto's Gemini. Mondo Macabro just put out a Blu-ray of this not long ago, and it's a pretty solid little movie. I recommend it if you like Shinya Tsukamoto. Uh, this is definitely one of his weirder movies, which I guess is saying a lot. The lead actor, Masahiro Matoki, he'd appeared in uh, another film about Itogawa Rampo, whose story this film's loosely based on. And this actor, Matoki, he'd also appeared in The Bird People in China, Departures, this anime, Takan King Crete. Definitely pretty recognizable dude. And there's some other people you'll recognize here, like an actress named Ryo, who plays the wife, Rin. She was also in a couple of Rihuhei Kitamura's films, Enter the Void, Scabbard Samurai. Uh, there's a tiny role for Tadanobu Asano, who of course is most known as Kakihara from Ichi the Killer, but he's also in Sogo Ishii's Labyrinth of Dreams, Nagisa Oshima's Taboo, Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts, Survival Style 5. Another Itogawa Rampo adaptation called Rampo Noir. And because it's a Tsukamoto film, there's a lot of his regular collaborators. Music by Chu Ishikawa, who scored 11 of his other films. Um, Takashi Miike directed a behind-the-scenes documentary about this film. It takes place at the end of the Meiji era in 1910, which is a pretty interesting change of pace from his modern industrial cyberpunk style that you see in a lot of Tsukamoto's films. Really great period costumes and detail. It's got a lot of his trademarks like jittery camera work, aggressive music, psychosexual dynamics. There's a really strong use of color in the movie with bright orange toward the beginning and then vivid purple and blue later on. So this is a neat little movie. Check it out if you're a fan of the director. Really good. I recommend it. Next up, a short film from 1999. I won't say too much about this one, but it's called The Scooby-Doo Project. And of course, <laughs> this is Cartoon Network trying to cash in on the success of the Blair Witch Project. They made this little like 16, 18 minute short film that was separated into small bits and would play between commercials and shows chopped up in pieces, you know. There's other things that aren't in the 18 minute short. You can actually see a restored 4K version of this available on YouTube at the moment. Also on YouTube, you can see the original broadcast from 1999 with all those cool late 90s commercials and the original format with it split up between the commercials. It's a pretty funny little tongue-in-cheek Scooby-Doo parody. Anytime Scrappy-Doo gets made fun of, you can't go wrong. Nobody wants him to tag along with the gang and solve their mysteries for him. So, check out the Scooby-Doo project. We move now into the 2000s with Draniac by Brett Piper, and special guest Alex Dickey is going to talk about this one. First, let me thank Video Psychosis and especially Strong Knots for having me on. I could not pass up an opportunity to prattle on at length about my most favorite Brett Piper movie, Draniac. Now, I call it my favorite, but really it's my favorite as of the time of this recording. I still haven't seen every Piper movie out there, but I've seen a good handful and can say with confidence that Draniac is my top number one Piper flick. I program and host a monthly show at the local independent cinema I work for as a projectionist and content creator, and was lucky enough to be able to show Draniac with our audience last year. Everyone present had a blast with it, which is not surprising at all. That's the only reasonable reaction to watching Draniac. It is nothing less than pure entertainment. And I can go on and on and on about the ingenious practical special effects that are commonplace in Piper features and are all on full, gooey, gory, impressive display in Draniac. Specifically, I could talk about its swift pacing and realistic and charming portrayals of friendship. I could go in-depth about, or as in-depth as one could possibly go, about Philip Barber's great value Dan Haggerty appearance as the folksy exorcist not so subtly named Plumber. I'm sure I could blabber on at length about those things, but what I'd really like to talk about is what I believe to be the part of Draniac that really makes it stand out in the crowd. I'm gonna talk about Wade. Yep, Wade is the cheap dollar store glue that really holds the foundation of the movie together for me. That was supreme exaggeration, but it's also partly true. If we overlook one shocking instance of animalistic cruelty that really made his death a deserving one, Wade is quite possibly the best character in the entire movie. He is so cartoonishly crude and unlikable in the most likable way, Piper probably had to turn him into a full-on rapey sleazebag or else his admittedly awesome some death scene would have been met with severe disappointment from the viewer. No, don't kill Wade! No! Why, Piper? Why? You'd all whine and bellow at your screens begging the movie to bring this charismatically crass curmudgeon of a character back to life. But no. 
despite the glimpses we get of Wade possibly being a relatable and tragic figure worth our pity, he hauls off and gropes and forces himself on poor Tanya, and all that pathos is gone in an instant. Now we're left cheering as Wade gets a water kelpie tentacle straight to his downstairs parts, and is viciously transformed into nothing more than a greasy skeleton who is never mentioned again for the rest of the movie. Oh Wade, why couldn't you have just stuck with your immature pranks and your middle school tier schoolyard insults? Maybe you would have survived a little longer. Maybe you would have survived until the very end like nearly everybody else. But Draniac's a horror movie, and horror movies need a body count though, so poor old Wade was always going to end up dead. But at least he went out as one of the best obnoxiously hilarious jackass blowhards ever to appear in any movie ever. Wade is Draniac to me, and Draniac is Wade. And I'm only half kidding. Next up, from 2001, we've got another horror anthology called Campfire Stories. This fucking movie right here, man. Uh, it's got these wraparounds with a lot of... There's a lot of TV actors in this movie. You got Jamie Lynn Sigler from The Sopranos, Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Joshua Harto of Oz. Basically, these two buddies are driving through the woods, find a hitchhiker, end up with car trouble. They run into this forest ranger, played by David Johansson, who you may recognize as the lead singer of the New York Dolls. He was also in movies like Scrooge, Candy Mountain, Let It Ride, the Tales from the Dark Side movie. And they sit around a campfire and hear a bunch of stories, the first story of which is about a bunch of stupid jocks, one of which is hilariously played by Perez Hilton, and who kills a squirrel in a tree with a golf club. Basically, these jocks are getting killed off by an ex-mental patient groundskeeper that they bullied at school, and it makes about as much sense as it sounds like. Another TV actor here in the first story, you've got the, the kid who tried to circumcise himself and nip tuck John Hensley in this story. So, yeah, there you go. Second story, you got a Native American stealing the youth from juvenile delinquents by letting them smoke his boof stick. And, uh, yeah, probably the highlight of the movie there. Kids smoking weed and selling their souls to a Native American. That was pretty funny. Third story is about a slasher with a video camera amongst some teens at a sleepover and has yet another TV actor, Rob McElhenney, who plays Mac on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. This is actually how he met Charlie Day, and they got that show started. So, as you can guess, this is worth seeing mostly for the TV actors. It's a pretty bad movie, and it has a really stupid twist at the end. Uh, the kids end up at this 90s Misfits Michael Graves era concert, and Meadow Soprano turns out to be a demon. This movie is to anthology horror movies what 90s Misfits is to punk rock, and that's total dog shit, so you can skip this one. Next up, Another film from 2001, it's Pulse by Kiyoshi Kurosawa. Now, Kiyoshi Kurosawa is not related to Akira Kurosawa, but he has made some other pretty memorable movies like Cure, Creepy, and Sweet Home from the 80s, which was pretty much the inspiration for the survival horror video game genre. I wasn't a huge fan of this movie. I thought that it was alright. The first half, I think, is a lot better than the second. I definitely agree with the Village Voice that the film's about a half hour too long. Uh, but it was pretty popular. I mean, they made a remake of it in 2006 with Kristen Bell. That's back in the early to mid-2000s trend of remaking Japanese horror here, like The Ring, The Grudge, One Missed Call. But uh, there's some really bad CGI in this one scene with ashes on the wall scattering around the room that it builds up to this unexpected apocalyptic ending. I don't know. I wasn't a huge fan fan of this movie but maybe it's just not for me a lot of you will probably like it it's pretty well regarded next up from 2002 massacre by joseph clark also known as bikini party massacre uh <laughs> a much better title and an accurate title there there are bikinis there's partying and there is a massacre in this movie this movie is ridiculously idiotic it's also hilariously funny uh, I got a huge kick out of this movie. I wouldn't call it good, but I do recommend it. It's Joseph Clark's only movie, and he also plays uh, Jeff in the film. Lots of bad early 2000s CGI, especially in the opening shot with a butterfly and a guy pissing over it. There's just so many weird things going on in this movie, like an overly long dream sequence that lasts way longer than it should. You've got a fucking music video that appears out of nowhere for no reason, doesn't add anything to the movie. You know, guys going to go get gas walking through the cornfields, and so you see the classic music video text song called Out of Gas from the album Walk in the Fields. What is that all about? There's a horrible Star Wars conversation that sounds like it came out of a Kevin Smith film, but I'd probably watch this movie again before I'd watch another Kevin Smith movie. There's some awkward sex and partying. You know, there's a truth or dare game that goes wrong. You've got a peeping redneck. 
um, hilariously inappropriate stuff. Like you find out the main character was sexually assaulted by her father and she sees this ghost everywhere. And she like, when she's telling her friends about how she was sexually assaulted by her dad, she says, I guess that's why I'm such a slut. Yikes. But this movie is just fucking insane. You've got an accidental threesome that happens because of a, a lesbian sex interruption. You've got a really surprising first kill that kind of takes you off guard. There's a ridiculous, overly bloody chainsaw kill. And, you know, hilariously, after you finish the movie, there's a, a little screen that pops up that says, No taxpayers were harmed during the making of this film. But if you probably were during the viewing of it. So, there you go. And if you get the DVD of this from Brain Damage, it has a hilarious biography of the director boasting about his role as a crack cocaine addict in a film called Cracked. Joseph Clark, where are you? What happened to you? We need a Bikini Party Massacre too. Next up, we've got another very special guest. Director Steve Cuden talks about his film Lucky from 2004. Hello fans of Video Psychosis. Steve Cuden here. For those of you who have never heard of me, which is probably all of you, I wrote 90 cartoons you may have heard of. Shows like The Batman, X-Men, Iron Man, Shaolin Showdown, Goof Troop, Extreme Ghostbusters, Gargoyles, and a whole bunch more. I also wrote the original book and lyrics of a fairly well-known Broadway musical called Jekyll and Hyde. I'm also responsible for co-producing and directing a truly sick little puppy of a movie called Lucky. Lucky came about because three friends, a brilliant comedy writer, the late Steve Sestarsik, a familiar actor, Mike Emanuel, and I, decided to join forces and make a close-to-zero-budget movie of Steve Sestarsik's extremely twisted script called Lucky. Lucky is about a down-on-his-luck, deeply alcoholic animation writer named Millard Mudd who drives over a dog on his way home from a beer run. Mudd thinks the dog is alive for three weeks before realizing the poor thing never made it. But once Mudd buries the animal, it pops back to life and telepathically speaks to Mud, enslaving him and turning him into a serial killer. I can assure you this film is not likely to ever wind up a favorite of the tea and finger sandwiches set. We shot the whole thing in nine and a half packed days, spending less than the budget for Tom Cruise's lunch on any Mission Impossible film. The cast includes Mike Emanuel as Millard Mudd, Piper Cochran as Misty, Mudd's fantasy girl come to life, Jillian Bach as the delivery girl, and playing Lucky is Sidney, the very same dog who gets stoned in Dude, Where's My Car? Lucky's voice is supplied by David Rivers, who you may have seen on numerous commercials and TV shows. David also happens to be the proud dad of Corbin Blue, who starred in High School Musical. Lucky took almost a year to edit, then went on to win a whole batch of film festival awards, including Best Feature Awards at the New York City Horror Film Festival, Shriekfest in L.A., Micro Cinefest in Baltimore, and The Weekend of Fear in Nuremberg, Germany. Be forewarned, Lucky is not for the faint of heart or weak of stomach. There's very little gore in it, but many people find it highly disturbing. Maybe you're one of those who enjoy being disturbed like that. If so, great, then Lucky will be for you. If you want to know more about who I am, you can check me out at stevecuden.com and also on my podcast, storybeat.net. That's all one word, storybeat.net, where I talk to all kinds of successful people in Hollywood, New York, and elsewhere in show business and the arts about their creative process. My recent guests include the star of Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston, Melody Thomas Scott, who has appeared on The Young and Restless for 40 years, and Andy Tennant, the director of Hitch, Sweet Home Alabama, The Kaminsky Method, and quite a few others. Well, my time's up here. My profound thanks for being a fan of Lucky. So we move now from the 2000s into the last decade, the 2010s, and we're going to start off with What We Do in the Shadows from 2014 by Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. Now, obviously, I don't think there's a lot to say about this movie. It's pretty popular. I remember when it came out about six years ago, and it seems like the cult for it has just grown and grown and grown since. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. When this movie came out, I used to frequent a movie theater in Atlanta called the Terra Theater, and I saw the trailer for this film 
several times before movies like Locke and Only Lovers Left Alive from my recollection, and I did not think it looked good. I thought the trailer was desperately unfunny, and there's something about seeing a trailer for a comedy in a theater with people laughing at jokes you don't think are funny that makes it look worse. So I pretty much avoided this movie for the last six years. And finally, after seeing that they made a TV spin-off of it with the great Matt Berry, who I'd watch probably anything he does, I decided I guess I'll check out this movie, because even if I hate it, I'll end up, you know, watching the show just to see Matt Berry. So, I didn't hate the movie. And it was worth seeing. I thought it was amusing. I didn't think it was hilarious. There, I got, I had a few mirthful chuckles. But, I don't know, I'm not part of the rabid cult for this movie. Not something I would feel the need to watch again. And who knows, maybe I'll pull a Mark Kerr mode and see this movie again in five or six years and be like, it's fucking great. But as of now, I think it's, it's okay. It's entertaining. Next up from 2017, a movie that surprised me very much. That's The Evil Within, directed by Andrew Getty. Okay, now this movie right here, man. I read this article years ago from The Guardian called A Millionaire, His Meth Addiction, and the Horror Movie 15 Years in the Making. And that's the story of how The Evil Within got made. And I don't really want to say too much because just go read that fucking article and then watch this movie because the story of how this movie got made is absolutely insane. You know, they began production in 2002, finished in 2008. The director was just obsessing over the editing. Then he died in 2015 from like, I think a hemorrhage uh, from smoking too much meth. And one of the producers had to help finish editing the movie. Uh, there's some familiar faces in here. You got Matthew McGrory from Devil's Rejects, Michael Berryman from Hills Have Eyes, Sean Patrick Flannery, Boondock Saints, Dina Meyer, Starship Troopers. You've also got a couple of people from Curb Your Enthusiasm, Jason Sklar and Tim Bagley are in this movie. Keep your eyes peeled, you'll notice a small cameo from Billy Mayo, who played the dad in Ari Aster's short film The Strange Thing About the Johnsons. He plays the host at the Monsoon Animatronic Restaurant. Now this movie is flawed and occasionally pretty heavy-handed, but I have to say, I was shocked at how genuinely nightmarish some of the imagery was and uh, how striking the effects work was at times during the movie. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. It's streaming on Tubi. Watch this fucking crazy meth head millionaire horror movie. It'll blow your ass off. I promise. It's crazy as hell. Check it out. Next up from 2018, it's Possum, directed by Matthew Holness. Now, if that name sounds familiar, Matthew Holness played Garth Marenghi on the show Dark Place. He's also on several other uh, comedy shows like Man to Man with Dean Lerner, Bruiser, The Office, he's in Toast of London. This was based on a short story that he actually published in The New Uncanny, Tales of Unease, and it was a bunch of stories based on Freud's essay about the uncanny. Now, this is a pretty eerie little movie. Uh, he claims that part of the film was actually inspired by UK show presenter Jimmy Seville, who turned out to be this like huge pedophile, and it was this big scandal over there in the UK. Part of the visual style was inspired by public information films from UK, like uh, you know, like TV stuff like 1973's Lonely Water with the Donald Pleasance narration. The lead actor, Sean Harris, you might recognize him from 24-Hour Party People, where he played Ian Curtis. He was also in the Red Riding films. The stepdad, Alan Armstrong, he was in Mike Hodges' Get Carter, Ridley Scott's The Duelist, he's in Kroll, Braveheart, Sleepy Hollow. Humorously enough, the director actually originally wanted John Amplis from George Romero's films to play the protagonist. Interesting little examination of trauma, you know, plays more as a psychological, emotional horror film. I think all you Ari Aster fans might enjoy this, and if you like movies like Repulsion, definitely check this out. Definitely not your average horror film. Next up, from 2019, we've got Haunt by Scott Beck and Brian Woods. I don't have too much to say about this. The only reason I saw it was because Joe Bob Briggs played it on The Last Drive-In, and I'm pretty uh, reluctant to watch a lot of newer horror films. Very often, they don't do much for me. And this one kind of fits right into that wheelhouse. It just, eh, you know, I didn't think it was bad, but it didn't really inspire much within me. It's not something I could see myself watching again or thinking about years from now. Uh, it was filmed in Kentucky, which is kind of funny because the plot's really similar to Haunted Ween, but I guess is a plot that's been seen in other films, you know, like the, you know, the spook house full of real killers, you know, other films like Malatesta's Carnival of Blood or Toby Hooper's The Fun House, Hellfest. I don't know, there's some good atmosphere in this movie and a cool setting, but I just didn't think there was anything to write home about. Lots of lame humor, terrible ending, didn't really care about any of the characters. I don't know, not for me, but you might enjoy it, so why not check it out? It's on Shudder. Next up is going to be the last guest spot on the show from very special guest speaker Vadim Dosmarov, talking about his 2019 short film, Mommy's Pickles. Hello, Strong Knots. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's a real honor to be able to share my film with you and your audience of horror movie lovers. We made a cool short film with an awesome group of filmmakers from abroad, which is the first Belarusian horror to premiere at a major film festival like Fantastic Fest in Austin, 
And we also showed at Beyond Fest in LA at the Egyptian Theater. Mommy's Pickles was kind of a dream come true to make. The entire process of making it, although it had its ups and downs, was entirely serendipitous. Uh, we got a very professional team together, and I was really lucky to work with them. It's, uh, I spent like six years in uh, Minsk, Belarus, where I got my degree in production design, and uh, that was uh, basically a trip all of in itself. But long story short, I was kind of trying to go back to my roots a little bit. I'm not really from Belarus, but uh, my whole family's from Russia, but it's the closest that I could uh, get to where our family came through, which luckily ended up becoming the, uh, the seed towards making this first film. So while there, rarely did I ever meet anyone from abroad, actually. Not a lot of people have heard or uh, visit Belarus, but by chance I met uh, the then creative director for Fantastic Fest at the Minsk International Film Festival called Listopad, uh, which is the following, falling of leaves, or uh, in Belarusian is basically like October, I think. The fellow's name was Evrim Ersoy, who is just a phenomenal person. That chance encounter in 2018 led me to try directing this film and kind of set, set the course for that to happen. Uh, I discovered a love for genre film that I already was kind of on the cusp of developing, but needed an extra push to become a full-out obsession. Premiering at Fantastic Fest was really the goal we set, or I set for the film, and we were really fortunate to premiere there. To take a film out of a country that most people have never heard of and show alongside such a wonderful lineup of films from all around the world is really like a wish come true, honestly. The idea of the movie was based on uh, my meeting a, a now ex, and I felt the scenario would be somewhat perfect for this little kind of ditty. Uh, a Texan meets a girl in rural Belarus and wants to bring her back to the U.S., but first he has to meet the mother, uh, and she likes to pickle things. Uh, the idea of the short was inspired by a few of my favorite films, kind of set, set the groundwork for for this little short film. Uh, one of them is Straight Jacket, um, a castle film, um, this uh, script was written by Robert Blotch. The, the character that kind of sprung out of that was this psycho bitty type, uh, strong female antagonist, y Yuliana Mikhnevich's performance, who plays Maria Ivanova in the short film. Uh, at that time, I'd also discovered the film Get Out. So Steve in the film, who's played by Nicholas Layfert, uh, is the sort of fish-out-of-water American who meets uh, Nastya, who's kind of reminiscent of this, like, Margaret's Museum type character and she can convey conveys this hopelessness of lost uh, lovers type lost dead lovers situation and 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 the remains of which are pickled pickles uh, kind of comments on the current situation and unrest in Belarus where in a tyrannical dictator I don't know if I'm supposed to say that I could bar my entry, re-entry to the country, and uh, kind of is represented with the antagonist uh, suppressing the desires of the people and lying to them, spoon-feeding them sweet lies like jam out of the jar, as as there is a scene like that in, in, in our short film. But I don't want to cheapen what's going on over there, as it's a really tragic thing. I mean, I'm basically, with the people that I'm, that I'm in contact with, they're getting kind of, I don't know if I am can curse on it, they're getting the shit beat out of them, and it's pretty brutal over there. Yeah, it's pretty bad, but um, we're happy that our little movie was able to make a, a sort of tour around and uh, kind of gives the hardworking people there a little bit of a break, enough to where it, it feels good for everyone involved to kind of uh, be outside of that for a moment. So that's kind of my two copics, uh, two cents on that. Uh, so glad to be able to share this film with you, and thank you, Strong Knots, and uh, appreciate you having me on. So we move now into the last of the films we're going to be discussing, and all three of these were released this year in 2020. We're going to start off with a short film called Alistair County by a friend of mine, Luke Patch. Now, a bunch of my friends worked on this short film. Some of them have been on the podcast before, like Andrew Lippincott and Bree Cummings. This was directed by Luke Patch, who plays Corgan on the internet comedy series Weekends with Corgan. This just premiered on Halloween night on YouTube, and you should check it out. 
It's really cool, really fun little short film. There's some great lighting in it. It's a freak show, circus, weirdo, psychobilly extravaganza. It's been years in the making and finally sees the light of day. And it's good to see it out there for everybody to check out. There's going to be a link to it down in the description of the video, along with other stuff on the show like Mommy's Pickles. So feel free to look below the in the description there if you want to check it out. And this is basically a morality tale about why you don't mix pills with booze that's all i'm gonna say about it really fun short film glad to see my friends finally complete it and it's really cool so give a look at that worth your time it's under 20 minutes we're gonna talk about relic by natalie erica james this is uh, her first feature film she's made several short films uh, i think the actress robin nevin uh, robin nevin is really great as the grandma in this movie. You might recognize her from films like The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith or The Castle. And this movie also has Emily Mortimer and Bella Heathcote in it. It's a really well-made film. It has good performances, very naturalistic, good sound design, but it kind of left me a little cold. Uh, the climax takes a turn for the dramatic, leans a little bit too heavy on being a metaphor movie, and it goes off the rails as, you know, the house starts deteriorating as grandma's losing her mind from dementia and I don't know, it's got that drab, muted gray color palette, which is really dour. And I mean, it matches the melancholy tone of the movie and the theme of the film, but it's not really very inspiring. I don't know, the last few minutes of this movie are quite good. I think the ending redeems the film. It might, wor it might work best for people with really emotional family ties. It's less of a straightforward horror film, but it is very interesting. And if you like films I talked about earlier, you know, like Ari Aster's films or Possum or Repulsion, stuff like that, check this out. Last up here, it's been a long show. We're going to conclude everything with a film just released last month called The Wolf of Snow Hollow, directed by Jim Cummings. Now, Jim Cummings made his first film in 2010 called No Flood Wall Here, but he's recently gained a lot more attention because he made a film called Thunder Road a couple years ago based on one of his own short films from 2016. He's only made the three features. He's working on a fourth now called The Beta Test. You might recognize him from acting roles in 13 Cameras and the really funny movie Greener Grass from last year. This is actually Robert Forster's last film role, and the movie's dedicated to him. I think this was a pretty good way for him to go out. A pretty good film to be remembered by. It's really entertaining. You've also got to recognize the actress Ricky Lindholm, who plays the character Julia. She was in the music duo Garfunkel and Oates. You've also seen her in movies like The Last House on the Left remake, Hell Baby, Under the Silver Lake, Knives Out. And this is actually, interestingly enough, one of nine films released by Orion Classics, you know? That company was resurrected from the dead. They hadn't made a movie since 1999. Now they're back, baby. Orion's back. This movie just came out, so it's on Amazon Prime Video On Demand. I definitely recommend checking it out. I'm not really a big fan of newer horror movies. This one's got a lot of comedy in it. And, you know, horror comedies can be hit or miss for me, but I really, really liked this movie. thought it was really funny. Some really good practical effects. Very little CGI. There is some, but not much. And it's an interesting focus on an alcoholic character kind of coming to terms with his problem and uh, trying to stop a werewolf in a small town. So I really recommend this movie. I thought it was really good. Definitely worth a look. And that's going to wrap it up for the 15th episode of the Video Psychosis Podcast. I'm your host, Strong Knots. Yet another Halloween we've burned through, talking about dozens and dozens of horror movies. Uh, feel free to drop a comment below. And check out those short films in the description below. Mommy's Pickles, Alistair County. Lots of good stuff here. I'd like to hear what anybody thinks. If you disagree with me, give me your thoughts on some of these movies. If, you, if you're a hardcore Jacko fan, I need to know why. Because I don't understand. <laughs> but with that being said that is going to bring an end to our 2020 halloween viewing and the 15th episode of the video psychosis podcast thanks a lot to all my guests for coming on the show and just like in the beginning of the show the song you're hearing behind me right now is from painted faces on the new album american basement just released on Bandcamp. give that a listen but for now goodbye video psychosis